and um, call the meeting to order. So good evening and welcome to the Thursday, May 13th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm David Narkowitz, the mayor and chair of the school committee. This meeting is being held as an online Zoom meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law um, issued back in March 12th of 2020. Um, we would ask folks who are joining this meeting from the public to um, uh, mute yourself. And, um, and obviously we will have a public comment period later in the evening, but if you could just uh, try to be cognizant of your mute button um, so that we can uh, have the business of the meeting go on without um, any interruptions. So um, let's begin first off by asking uh, the um, clerk to call the role of the school committee. Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Member Busanski. Uh, oh, I think that's right. She's not, she's not going to be here tonight. Yes, Member, she's out of town. Right, she's out of town. Member Fallon. Present. Member Seraphy Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. And Member Gold. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the, um, Typically our first order on the agenda is public comment, uh, but this is a, a special, has been a special week. So we actually have a special um, proclamation to, that I will issue today. We'll also um, be hearing from a special guest as well as part of that proclamation. So um, I am pleased this evening to present a special proclamation um, honoring school Lunch Hero Day. I've got the proclamation here. Don't know if you can see it. Um, and um, and uh, this is actually um, a day that occurs once a year, actually occurred on May 7th. Um, and there was actually a commemoration on May 7th, but we wanted to recognize this important day um, at our school committee meeting so that um, folks attending and watching could also he uh, hear about it as well. So I'll issue this proclamation. It's entitled School Lunch Hero Day, of Friday, May 7th, 2021. Whereas within days of the Northampton School's COVID-19 related closure, the food service department had established an emergency meal program. And whereas the Northampton Public School Transportation Department supported this effort by delivering meals to community-based distribution sites, and whereas the Northampton School District's outreach social workers regularly delivered emergency meals to families who could not bring their children to the distribution sites due to transportation issues or other barriers. And whereas local restaurants and businesses, including Belly of the Beast, Haymarket Cafe, Grow Food Northampton, The Quarters, and River Valley Community Co-op partnered with the Northampton School Department and whereas even while resuming traditional breakfast and lunch programs in the district as schools have reopened, the food service department has continued to implement a community-based emergency meal program to ensure that students learning remotely continue to receive nutritious meals. And whereas the food service department served more than 280,000 emergency meals from March 2020 through April 2021. So now, therefore, I, Mayor David Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim May 7th, 2021, to be School Lunch Hero Day in the city of Northampton. The Northampton School District expresses its deep appreciation to these valuable employees and commends their good work on behalf of children. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the city of Northampton. So congratulations and thank you. I see, um, I see folks uh, from our uh, food service department. Um, Estelle is here, um, but we also have a special video. Are you going to be queuing that up, Annie? Um, we, um, 
We have a special video that's been put together by um, uh, NPS parent and uh, New York Times um, award-winning author, uh, Jared Kraszowska, um, who uh, was also part of the presentation um, earlier uh, today. Um, and um, go ahead and roll the video. Uh, I'm waiting for it to load up. Okay. Um, Are you able to share screen? I'm trying to, here it is. It's still loading and um, can, okay. Can everybody see it? Uh, so you started screen sharing. Okay. Let it start. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. I think you might have it there. You may have to restart it again, Annie. Uh, go back to the beginning. It's it's stopping itself. It, okay. It's yeah. So why don't you stop and let me see if I can share it. Good idea. Because um, I think I may have it. Um, okay. I'm trying to pause it, but it's it's not okay. listening to me. I would just stop screen sharing then. That's... Okay. I'm gonna get out of here and then stop share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I just have to find the video, um, which I think I, I think you provided me with a link. Um, um, I, I will resend it to you right now. Okay, that'd be helpful. Um, I'm pretty sure I have it uh, embedded in one of my many emails here. Um, cancel. Oh, boy. Um, wow. Okay. Wow. I did just forward it to you again. Okay, great. Let me um, let me just uh, get that quickly. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, one. Hmm. Okay. For some reason. Okay. Here we go. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, has not arrived yet. Um, okay, try plan B here. Okay, so first, let me um, share my screen. Uh, I think that's right. Okay, and let me just um, accept. That's not going to be good. And so this is the video, I believe. Mm -hmm. Here is the video. Can everyone see uh, Jared? Can everyone see him? Okay. All right, I'm gonna play the video then. Thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Thank you, Dr. Provost. My name is Jared Krasowska and I'm the author and illustrator of the Lunch Lady graphic novel series. But more importantly, I'm a proud parent in the Northampton public school system. I wanna take this moment to thank every single person who has worked so hard throughout the pandemic to make sure that our students remain fed. I have seen the firsthand the efforts being made to, to put lunches onto school buses and bring them to feeding sites. I wanna thank you all so much for what you do. And, uh, and it's something that you do every single day, pandemic or not. But of course this year has been especially stressful uh, and I so admire your steadfastness and, and your courage and the love that you have for these students. Uh, so every single one of you should have received today a framed, drawing that I made for you on the occasion of this proclamation uh, to say thank you so much. And um, I hope that you enjoy a wonderful summer coming up as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Jared, for that, um, for that wonderful message and for sharing that uh, beautiful artwork um, with our food service team. Um, I wonder if I can turn it over to Mistel Hanna now, just say a few words and um, on behalf of the team, I can, uh, uh, there you go. Oh, nothing like being on the spot, but thank you. It is really incredibly kind to be acknowledged. Um, our group is amazing. <laughs> it's a wonderful team that grew exponentially this um, school year, as mentioned with the bus drivers and social workers and custodians. Um, and it's just been um, amazing, an amazing year. So thank you so much. 
for all the support and administrators, you know, without Dr. Provost's um, support as well, it would have been even more challenging than it already was. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Dr. Provost, do you have anything to add? I know you were um, at JFK, I think today. Um, so do you have anything to add? Yes, I'll just add that um, we're doing something a little bit out of the ordinary this year, and I think it's warranted. Um, as I went through the process of writing the proclamation and realizing all of the individuals that were involved in the effort, what the results of the effort were and how long and sustained the effort was, it, it really became um, apparent to me that we had to go above and beyond this year to try to, in some way, um, acknowledge our, our food service staff, our social outreach workers, our bus drivers, our local businesses, and everyone who was involved in the effort of keeping our students fed this year. This truly was life-saving work for a lot of our families over the course of this year. And I've said many times, I think it's one of the greatest accomplishments of the district in the time of the pandemic. Um, and so I was really pleased that Jarrett was able to help us um, appropriately acknowledge our staff. I can tell you, Jarrett was with us at the JFK presentation, but Ms. Stell and I went to each of the schools and replicated that, okay. that presentation. And the staff were just so overjoyed to receive those drawings. Um, it meant so much to them and they mean so much to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Provost. Um, any other staff or administrators want to say any words? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much again to our, our school lunch heroes uh, for everything you've done during the pandemic and obviously um, in pre and post pandemic times uh, to keep our, our children fed. Um, Member Voss, your hand is raised. Nope. Okay. Oh, just clapping. I'm sorry. That's the clapping. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so um, now we will move on in the, in the agenda, um, which now I have to go back and get. Um, so um, next item would be um, our public comment period. So what I'll do is I'll ask folks to use the raise hand function in Zoom, um, which has now been moved for most people to the reactions uh, uh, tab on the lower menu. Um, uh, and uh, if you are calling in on a phone, you'll have to use the phone functions uh, to do that. Um, but I'll ask you to unmute yourself. I'll ask you to please identify yourself and where you live. And I will keep a timer of three minutes um, so that everyone has an equal amount of time. So the per first person uh, with their hand raised right now is Jonathan Brody. Jonathan, go ahead and unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Um, thanks to everyone um, and to the lunch folk. Uh, it's one of the highlights of my kid's day. And I would agree with Dr. Provost. It was really a shining um, moment for the district, you know, in the pandemic response. It was really impressive. We had a lunch pickup site around the corner from our house. Just job well done. So, um, and thank all of you uh, just for your continued work in such a difficult year. You heard, have heard from me a few times over the course um, of the year. Um, some of you have ignored me, it's totally okay. Um, I got a little COVID wacky at times and I probably would have ignored myself uh, getting some of the emails I sent. So um, just really um, appreciate your patience. Um, but tonight, if you could just like give me a little bit of your attention, I, I would really appreciate that. Um, less wacky now, um, and it's in regards to the district improvement plan. Um, it was released a few days ago. Um, I think it was really a great start um, to what I think is a critical you seem to have lost your sound, John. Yeah, lost his audio. We've lost your audio. Jonathan, um, we can't hear you. Mm. Uh, really take some time in its process and uh, the eventual product. Um, Jonathan, can you start again from critical? <laughs> sure, is it better now? Yes. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. So it's about the district improvement plan. It's such a critical document. It's really a guide for the next three to five years for the district um, and so much rides on it. And um, it was a great start, as I was saying, in regards to social justice and equity, uh, in regards to kind of the resource and outcome inequities, particularly as it pertains to our um, elementary school, Bridge Street School, which has experienced significant inequities for years now. Um, and as well as the inequities that exist at JFK that I think are kind of in stark contrast uh, in, the, in the district and in regards to kind of how uh, the different schools function. So essentially what I'm uh, suggesting is, because I, I know you all, are, it's coming up for a vote this evening, and I'm, I really want to uh, encourage you all to delay the vote, to give more time uh, for the community um, to be able to look at the document and work with the document. I think it's especially important um, due to, um, uh, since so many of the goals are focused in and around engaging the community, that more community engagement needs to happen before uh, you all vote uh, and approve the document, number one. Um, Number two, um, related to that, that it needs to be more inclusive of the voices of the students, the families, the teachers, uh, particularly the groups that um, uh, it focuses on people of color, um, you know, students with disabilities. As these, as we know, these uh, students and their families are disproportionately affected, um, you know, by inequities, um, you know, and resource distribution within the district. And lastly, it, that the document needs um, to be more specific. We hold our teachers and our special education process to a high standard in regards to SMART or SMARTY goals, specific, measurable, attainable, um, time limited, um, and of course that include inclusiveness and in, in equ equity. And, um, I've talked with some several members about this, and I can certainly send a DESI related resource in regards to the importance of having smart goals. And I think this document and this body- You're, you're at time, Jonathan, so if you could just wrap up, please. Yep, just that this body needs to hold itself to the same standards that it holds its teachers and its students, and that this document needs to become much more specific and smart in its focus to increase its efficacy and increase the accountability related to it. Um, so thank you so much in considering delaying the vote, opening the process to the community and refining this document to be more efficacious and accountable. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't see other hands raised. Are there any other hands that are, um, any other folks who wish to speak in public comment? Okay. Okay. So that will conclude then our public comment for this evening. Um, okay. I've just got to um, get back to my um, agenda. Uh, one second here. Um, I had it up on the screen and then I lost it for when I switched over to video mode. Um, I believe then is the next item on the agenda announcements from school committee members, Annie. Okay, so why don't we go ahead? Are there any announcements if members want to raise hands to let me know about announcements? Okay, um, Member Voss, if you could uh, go ahead and unmute and you have the floor for any announcements. Okay, thank you. I just want to announce to the community and the other members that I will not be seeking re-election to the school committee later this year. And I want to encourage community members to consider running and would be happy to chat with anyone who wants to know more about this role. And I'll also share that I promise I'll be right now. to continue to work hard as your school committee member for the remaining 232 days in my term. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Member Voss. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is Member Fallon. Thanks. Um, yes, I also wanted to announce that I will not be seeking re-election. Um, 
I'll actually be um, enrolling in law school in August and my scholarships are conditional on maintaining um, a high GPA. So I'm a little bit nervous about it, but I will hopefully also be finishing out my term <laughs> of how 200 and 32 days, I think uh, member Voss said, but I would love to speak with any members of Ward 2 um, about the roles and responsibility and the time commitment involved. Um, my phone number and email are on the Northampton Public Schools District website on the bottom. You can find any of us um, there under the heading for school committee. Thanks. Okay. Um... I'm tempted to close announcements given the uh, given how they've gone so far, <laughs> but I do see Member Levy has her hand raised for an announcement. Member Levy. Oh, except that I think other people were ahead of me, but I'm happy to go. Okay, um, I'm not sure. Hands went up and down, and so um, you okay. were you were next, and then, but then Member Gold's Great. hand just came back up again. So okay, got it. Um, so I would like to announce that I am going to be running for re-election for Ward 5. I've really, really appreciated, uh, and I'm, I also am saddened by the, the announcements that we've just heard because I've truly, truly learned from both members Voss and members, member Fallon. Um, I uh, have really, really appreciated learning what it is to be on the school committee and I feel like I still am. I'm excited to be a part of a school committee that's hopefully engaged when it is not a global pandemic uh, and able to really think about bringing more continued focus on equity, transparency and, and community. Thanks. Thank you, Member Levy. The next person whose hand is raised is Member Gold. Member Gold. Yeah, and, uh, I'm the um, Northampton Open Media Liaison, and so I just wanted to uh, provide a brief update because uh, I haven't done too many of those and as their liaison, but just to let you know that in case you and anyone didn't see it, there was a wonderful article in the Gazette, I believe it was yesterday morning, um, um, about the great work that Northampton Open Media has done um, throughout this pandemic and continuing its great work and community efforts uh, to keep cinema going and media going, and also to announce that... Um, I was, we, their meetings right before this one, so I was on there at 5.30, that um, tomorrow, uh, they've been in a partnership with um, Crowdsource Cinemas in Vermont um, for a crowdsourcing filming activity. I don't know the exact details of it. They call it a film sprint, but tomorrow night on Northampton Open Media at seven o'clock, finalists are gonna be announced. So if you wanna see some really creative things going on in Northampton Open Media's efforts with that, check it out tomorrow at 7 p.m. Thank you, Member Gold. Um, the next person with a hand raised for announcements is Member uh, Seraphie Cox. Yes, and sorry for putting my hand up and then down and then back up again. Um, I uh, uh, was originally going to uh, put up my hand because I uh, spoke with the city clerk this week and uh, heard that I was the only person who had taken out papers for school committee. So I wanted to basically announce to the community that, that this was an opportunity for folks uh, to run. And uh, um, I'm glad to hear that uh, member Levy will be continuing and of course saddened to hear about members Fallon and Voss. Um, but also congratulations member Fallon on law school and, uh, and uh, totally understand that it would be difficult to do both. Um, although I also would say that this was a very good prerequisite for law school and you will be excellent. Um, but yeah, so that was, I mean, my main purpose was to, was to just encourage the community to, um, to talk with their neighbors and and uh, and find good folks to uh, to serve on our uh, on our school committee uh, for the next round, especially if we have vacancies. Thank you, Member Seraphy Cox. Are there any other announcements from uh, members of the school committee? Okay, thank you. Thank you to all for those announcements. Um, we'll now move on to the next uh, section of our agenda, which is recommended actions. Um, and we actually have on our consent agenda this evening, um, uh, four sets of school committee meeting minutes, 
uh, February 8th, 2018, February 27th, 2018, March 22nd, 2018, and April 20 and April 12th, 2018. We also have we also have a field trip. Um, our, the RK uh, Finn Ryan Road School walking field trip to the Sawmill Hills Conservation Area, April 30th. I said I was peeing. Seventh. Um, in the bathroom. I'd like to remind folks about muting yourself. Know. I'll just go ahead and do a little mute all there. <laughs> so just want to just a friendly reminder about our mute policy. Um, we do have live mics here. Um, so the next um, item that's part of the consent agenda is we also have um, uh, budget transfers um, in the amount of $92,000 from student services to therapy, uh, $177,466 from student services to collaborative tuition, and, and 12500 from student services to testing supplies. So those are the three components of our consent agenda, and I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with any removals. So moved. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Um, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on the consent agenda, please. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serfi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Uh, yes, although I would abstain from the minutes part, but yes to everything else. So I guess it's a yes, but I'm just making that known that I don't feel comfortable approving minutes for meetings I was not a part of. Okay. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Uh, yes, I'll uh, member Levy. Okay. And Mayor Narcoy. Uh Yes. Uh, the vote is seven or nine in favor, but two actually abstaining from the minutes. Two with an asterisk. Okay. Two with an asterisk, great. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, that's enough to uh, adopt the consent agenda. So uh, thank you for that. Um, the next item on the agenda is we have a vote um, to accept um, donations. We have two donations this evening. One, a $5,000 gift from National Grid to the NHS robotics team and a $3,100 gift from the JFK PTO for the purchase of a new kiln. And I would accept a motion to accept those two donations. So moved with gratitude. Is there a second. second? Okay. Is there any discussion or other information required uh, on these gifts? If not, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, I apologize. I didn't see who seconded the motion. Member Fallon. Okay. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Yeah. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes, thank you very much. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. And Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Excellent. Those two gifts are, are gratefully accepted by the school committee. The next item on our agenda as we move into reports and recommendations is our student representative report. And uh, we are scheduled to hear from Tally Serlin and Megan O'Connor. Um, Tally and Megan, I'll ask you to unmute yourselves and um, the floor is yours. Hey everyone. For those of you who don't know us, we're the high school representatives from the NHS Student Union. My name is Tali. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Megan and 
Tali and I are just going to update you on what's been going on at NHS. Um, these past few weeks have been mostly testing days. AP tests for in-person have been happening as well as the MCAS, and the students are all doing a great job. Um, the math and English MCAS tests were canceled for the, the class of 2022, who are the current juniors, but the sophomores and certain juniors who opted into the MCAS have been spending their mornings doing that. Um, after this week, most of the testing is wrapping up, which is something that I'm sure all of the NHS students, including myself, are really looking forward to. Our most exciting news is that almost all students are going in person five days a week starting Monday the 17th, so that's this coming Monday. Um, for some of those students, myself included, this will be their first time in the building for school purposes in over a year. Um, we can't wait to get back to some normalcy. Thank you all so much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions from the school committee? No, um, thank you both for that um, concise report and, and good luck with the remainder of the school year. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is a report from our rules and policy committee and I'll turn to member Fallon. Thank you. Um, so Everyone should have received a copy of the school committee handbook that we've been working on off and on for over a year now. Um, I want to start by apologizing. I don't remember what computer or program I started this on, but clearly the formatting did not transfer well to the Google document. So I am very much aware that the formatting is um, problematic. But what we'd like um, from the rules and policy subcommittee is for you tonight, if you have any questions about it to ask us, I'm gonna go through it in a minute, but, um, and then to take between this meeting and the next to actually um, kind of formulate really concise feedback for us before we do further work and, and come up with a final version. We didn't wanna to put too much more time into this um, until we were sure that the full committee approved of the direction that we were taking. Um, so it, this handbook is meant to essentially orient um, new school committee members to uh, the roles and responsibilities of a school committee member. And I just want to be clear that 99% of the language in this is taken from our own rules of procedure, our own um, policy documents. In most cases, those policy documents are referenced. Um, and for instance, the, it, it starts with their mission and vision that is taken from our website, our vision statement um, and mission statement for the Northampton Public Schools. Um, and pretty much every, yeah, going through it, who we are, how we conduct business, who we represent, how we communicate, all of this comes from our own um, policies. We're hoping to add hyperlinks referencing all of the policies. In some cases, I have um, listed, for example, new member orientation. I said policy reference BIA, um, but it explains essentially everything to do from the moment you're elected or appointed to office um, and sworn in by the city clerk, like what materials you should do, what you're required to do as far as um, new member orientation by law, how long you have to do that. Um, and um, then it goes on to the organization of the committee. And um, once again, that aligns with our policy, the roles of the chair and vice chair, um, the subcommittee and liaison positions. And um, I think, yeah, and then professional development opportunities, um, representative op opportunities, et cetera. And the, then the goals, budget, et cetera, and all of the policies that have to do with each of the primary responsibilities of a school committee member. So um, budget, superintendent evaluation, um, and policy creation. Um, and so essentially, we wanted to answer any pressing questions you had about the overall organization of this tonight, um, and then give you the whole month essentially to comb through it and bring us um, areas that you had concerns with, questions, um, or areas that you would like to see clarified before we finalize the document and really clean up the editing. Member so Goldman, I don't know. Member Goldman has her hand up, uh, perhaps for a question or comment. Member Goldman? I do. Um, Member Fallon, thank you so much to you and um, the 
committee for putting this together. It is, I, I really wish I'd had one when I started and I'm so excited for this to be available for all of us to kind of get on the same page. And I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving deeper into it and providing some specific feedback. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how you think maybe our norms document or our rules of procedure would um, pair with this. Thanks. So, so one of the things that we had talked about was, and I think it was my colleagues on the subcommittee that were like, you, because I had initially, I think, attached actual physical policies to it, old school style. And they said, every time we change a policy, you're going to have to now update this document. And so I think the intention is to just um, add a hyperlink, add a link to the policy section of our website so that none of those changes have to be made. And as I said, the currently this aligns with our rules of procedure. Another way of doing it would be to explicitly state that this, you know, that you are responsible for abiding by the rules of procedure, and those are voted on at the beginning of every um, session at the first meeting of January, and and provide a link to that if you think that that would be easier than having to, or better than changing the document. Um, every time a new committee or every year when the new committee um, votes on the rules of procedure that they're going to adopt. As far as the norms, I can't imagine, I mean, because these are taken from our own from our own policies, if they're in conflict with the norms, I think we have a bigger problem that we need to examine our policies um, and potentially change those. Um, I think that because though this would be a more of a guiding document for all school committees, you know, over the next few years, whereas the norms are specific to um, the current that that's, you know, the school committee that votes on them, that I think that um, we can reference it and then say that, you know, I think we talk about developing norms and protocols that that's a part of being an effective school committee, but I don't think that it should be included within the document because that would be unique to an individual composition or an individual group. Thank you. Member Levy, you had your hand up next. Oh. I did, I, I think I didn't lower it quick enough. I was gonna say exactly what Member Fallon just said about the norms aspect. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or feedback for Member Fallon and the Rules and Policy Committee about the handbook? Um, again, uh, my understanding is the intent is for us to take a look at it over the next month and give you additional feedback, but Echo yeah. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. I, I see, yeah. Member Seraphie Cox. Member Seraphie Cox. Oh, I was just gonna um, thank Member Fallon for all of her super hard work on this document. Um, it's gonna be a really important asset for um, new school com co committee members moving forward. Well, it was it was a labor of love. It is hopefully going to help guide whoever steps in next. <laughs> um, so next, the, as part of our um, report for rules and policy, um, I am going to ask Member Levy. So we have been working on um, on the anti-bias policy, and she actually took the lead on that um, with. Um, our attorney and um, Dr. Provost after our last meeting. I don't know if changes were made, et cetera. So I'm gonna just let her um, present that to the committee. And then in the same way, I can um, kind of summarize our meeting with ALT that we had, uh, the, the comments that were made, suggestions, areas to be clarified um, and any concerns. And then I guess, you know, if there are, questions, we can answer them the best we can. And otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'd like to get really targeted feedback at the next meeting so that we can get that to everyone um, in its final version for our first reading. Thanks. Uh, so I, I will admit that I don't exactly remember how much background information you all have about this at this point. So I'm going to go back a little ways and I apologize if it's a little repetitive, but I think it's important to understand where we were coming from when we were putting this together and drafting it. Um, in response to the resolution we passed to, to ban the, the Confederate flag, what 
what we've found is that because of state law in Massachusetts, the law reads that we can only restrict speech that has already proven to be a disruption to, to students learning. And that leaves us being incredibly reactive without any tools to be proactive. And so what we've done is put together something that we hope will allow us to be much more proactive and to really use educational tools, including restorative practices, to be able to, to not just respond to incidents as they occur, but to educate students um, about their impact and, and why they're harmful in schools. And so what we've done is we've modeled this, this draft of a policy off of one that came out of the state of Oregon. There's not actually anything like this right now in the state of Massachusetts. Um, we are hopeful that this gives us an opportunity to be a bit of a leader and to help the rest of the districts in our state think about how we can be proactive to um, not just think about uh, symbols that cause already have caused disruption, but, but ones that can be reasonably understood that they would or will cause disruption if they're present. So what we have is a, a policy that both um, uh, restricts symbols of hate um, and puts out a protocol to respond to bias incidents. We, uh, we thought it was, again, really important to ensure that we were equipped with tools. Um, and in sharing this with the ALT team, uh, we have incorporated their feedback and um, there was a lot of, of gratitude and excitement for moving forward with this. So they were very much supportive of, of moving forward with this policy. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Are there folks on the subcommittee who wanna to add to that background? I think Coleman has her hand up. I'm not sure if it's a question about this policy or, or comment. It is related. Um, I was reviewing notes and I know that um, there was a question put to MASC about, um, I think Lonnie spearheaded the inquiry um, about any issues with the Confederate flag ban. And Liz at MASC said that her colleague, Glenn would um, present the issue to the Mass Council of School Attorneys. This was back in March and get back to us. And I, um, from who I've talked to, no one I've talked to has reported that they've uh, received any feedback from that? And I was just wondering if Lonnie or anyone else had. I have not. No, I can, I, uh, thanks for the reminder though. I can check into it again if you like, or, or you can do so. Which would you prefer? Okay, that's fine. I'll reach out to her directly myself. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, it was just related. It, I yeah. like the way Member Levy that you introduced this protection policy because it is sort of like right, talking about some of the obstacles to setting policy with some right. of hate. And I, I will add that um, we, I think we did share with you that we met with um, representatives Sabadosa and Senator Comfort to talk about what is currently happening at the state level uh, and potential legislation that could support our efforts here and they were very supportive. There is something that may come to the floor soon that's somewhat related, but it doesn't go nearly as far as this does um, in being proactive and in really talking about uh, bias response. Um, and so they were very supportive uh, of our, again, sort of being out in front and, and doing what we think is necessary for our district in hopes that other districts could come along as well. Are there any other questions about this? So what are the next steps uh, for this uh, process, Member Levy? Turning that back over to Member Fallon, I believe we are looking for input now. Is this is this considered our first reading? No, no. So I just I did want to share with the committee so specific feedback from Alt, um, and we so appreciated them taking time to meet with us during the transition to in-person learning. Um, but their feedback was really important to us. Um, they did make suggestions regarding, for instance, um, 
having uniform and ample signage around buildings and on property, school property, um, and to make sure that the pol if a policy were passed, it was placed in the code of conduct. And um, they raised questions about the best ways to present this um, to school community members and staff, um, the possibility of making a video, uh, posting it on the district website. Um, but there was clarification then requested as far as the role of um, associate principals and vice principals in uh, the appeal process. So I'm not sure if that's an area that they've, it's been addressed. Okay. Um, and the, the, the fact that we can't report the outcomes um, of investigations many times due to privacy um, concerns. Um, but the biggest issue that was raised, I'll be honest, was around sporting events at the high school. And, um, and this would be uh, more easily eliminated. There is legislation that um, Senator Comerford did file um, to take up um, the mantle essentially uh, against imagery and mascots that are deemed insensitive to ind indigenous communities. And so if that were to pass, it would really eliminate this issue. But in the meantime, um, the questions that sort of emerged are, you know, there are, there are teams that are sports teams that we play in the high school that have um, mascots that would be deemed a violation of our, of our own policy. And so what is our intention as the school committee as far as um, will we not play those teams? Do you, um, if we're in postseason play against a team that has a Native American um, or indigenous mascot, um, what is our policy then? Um, and the question of enforcement, um, when we have visitors to facilities, sometimes sporting events get tense to begin with. Um, and the fact that we may only have one administrator or one site manager at um, a very crowded um, football field or basketball field, and we are um, asking them to enforce this policy with visiting bans, um, the question of whether we would need to be able to provide um, additional support to them as far as like additional site managers. Um, and so th that was the biggest question that I think remained sort of unanswered. And as I said, you know, it, part of this would be addressed if the if bill, the Senate bill 417 were to pass this session, um, but I don't know, um, I don't know how else we could address that otherwise. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't know what, if anyone has questions, concerns, but essentially it's a lot to think about. Um, if you have questions that don't occur to you tonight, but before the next meeting, I think Dr. Provost would be a great resource so that we wouldn't be in violation of open meeting law. And, um, and then otherwise, if you could give us really, you know, detailed feedback for, for next month so that we could bring it to you for a first reading. This may be obvious, but I just was wondering, I, I'm assuming our legal counsel has reviewed it and given us some feedback on it. Okay, that'd be helpful. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Are there any other reports uh, from budget and property this evening? I'm sorry, rules and policy, my, my mistake. No, that was all for us. Okay, so um, I believe um, budget and property would be our next report. Um, we received a um, uh, superintendent evaluations on the agenda. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I'm once again lost my um, agenda here in the sea of tabs. Um, so I'll, let me go to Member Condon and do the um, superintendent evaluation uh, committee. We'll take it personal, Mayor. No problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so the rule, the superintendent evaluation committee uh, sent out to you on May 1st, uh, or I should say, Dr. Provo sent out to you a superintendent evaluation questionnaire. Um, if you haven't looked at it, uh, it is a document or that was put together by Member Goldman and uh, Dr. Provost uh, to help us work through the evaluation process. Um, if you haven't looked through it yet, uh, it, uh, there's some good information in there. There's a summary of the superintendent's uh, responsibilities uh, and role in the district. Um, there's an overview of, of our role in the district. 
Um, there are, there's a copy of his goal setting form, which we had previously approved. Uh, there's a copy of the progress report that you had received separately prior to this, prior to the last meeting. Um, all of that condensed into one document so that, you know, one stop shop. And then finally, uh, an area for you to add some um, thoughts and feedback on uh, Dr. Provost's performance uh, for his evaluation. Um, so uh, a reminder, the email tells you this, but I'll remind you as well, uh, you should only be sending that to me to avoid open meeting law violation. Um, so when you get a chance to take a look at that uh, and put your thoughts into it, please send it my way. Any questions about that? Thank you. Oh, member boss. I, do, I, I have a question and a suggestion, maybe depending on the answer to the question. Um, could you, how does it avoid open meeting law if we all members of this committee send member con our um, responses? And I guess part B of that question is if you don't read them. I mean, I guess where I see it potentially violating open meeting law is if you read our responses before you create your response, because in a sense, we're all talking to you. But if you aren't reading them, then I think the argument is it's not. But if you look at the Attorney General's website for best practices in this, which I did yesterday when I was thinking about this, it says under certain conditions, we could send them all to member Condon, but um, it would be recommended to go through somebody else. So I'm just wondering if it would be smarter for them to go through Annie or Tracy and then show up at a public meeting together. Uh, I believe the thought was that uh, if, if just you or other members share it with me, there are only two people conversing about your thoughts. So it's not uh, a majority. Um, so I'm not sharing, for example, your input to me, I'm not sharing with anyone else. I'm gonna put everything together anonymously and then share with the rest of the evaluation committee. So they won't know the, the various pieces where they come from. Uh, they'll just, they'll all be filed together. So your thoughts on the first goal will be put together with member Gold's thoughts on the first goal and so forth, but your names won't be attached to them. Um, I'll just say, I think um, in the past, I've been told our names would be attached to them. It would be discussed in a public meeting. I'm fine with that. That's my understanding of it. But what I worry about is the way, the lens it looks for you, member Condon, because it's sort of like, you could interpret it as you're having an individual conversation with each of us. And that's where I'm worried. Like, I don't know best practice for that. I think Dr. Dr. Provost had his hand up. Dr. Provost. So um, if this is helpful, the maybe we could just talk about the next steps. And so the next steps would be to have the information shared in a public meeting. The idea was for this evaluation subcommittee to have a meeting to go over all of the responses and to develop the final evaluation to bring to you for your approval sometime in July. So um, at the time of the final meeting of the subcommittee, that's when all of that information will be publicly revealed. The members of the subcommittee would have a chance to discuss it. And then member Condon would be charged with condensing it all into a document that represented the subcommittee's recommended final evaluation that they'll be bringing to the school committee in July. Member Goldman, did you have a question about this uh, on this topic? No, yeah, I just wanted to, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, sorry. Um, go through the timeline that um, you received the first glimpse and even within the report starting on page 15 where you put your comments, there are sections that I think um, you'd want to answer after those topics are presented to the committee. For example, um, the district improvement plan section um, you, you know, it would make sense for you to add your comments after tonight's presentation on the dip. And then that's also the case with the ed trust analysis on June 10th, you wouldn't fill out that section 
until after that presentation. Although um, the the goal is simply to ha make that happen, um, regardless of the results of the survey. So to some extent, you would be able to fill that out. But I think the idea was that on June 10th, um, all of the committee members would have already completed this and thought it through, except maybe the ed trust piece. And um, is the formal discussion on the July 8th? No, June 10th, there'd be a discussion. So everything that you would be providing on the questionnaire would also be a part of the discussion in a public meeting. And then it would be collected and put in for um, the final ratings and review after the um, superintendent evaluation subcommittee meeting between the June and July meetings. Okay. Um, thank you for that timeline. Um, so uh, any other questions? Um, I do remember reading, yeah. I do remember reading member Voss, um, there had been an update or uh, I know there's an FAQ on, on evaluations, you know, and, and the difference between evaluations by members of public bodies and by uh, public employees and um, the whole idea of accessibility to the public. And I know we talked about that a few years ago about, you know, uh, posting them in advance on the website so that they were open to the public, you know, public would have a chance to look at them. I don't know, Member Fallon, do you have anything on, are you raising your hand? Yeah, yeah I was raising my hand. I was just going to say there was a case and the Attorney General did offer a ruling and granted it was three years ago now, four, almost four. Um, Lincoln Sudbury ran into this issue essentially over um, what was public, what was private. And in their ruling, they had individual members send their evaluations to the chair who then um, made a composite and did not attribute the individual's um, comments to like they were anonymous in the same way and the the question I guess was was whether or not those were public records the individual responses and whether uh, versus the you know the, the entire document and whether that was allowable and it was found that it was allowable and that um, only the final document with the anonymous comments was was Re uh, required to be disclosed as public records. And so that's the, I mean, I, the part that the takeaway for me is just that, that the attorney general ruled on this case and found in favor of Lincoln Sudbury using that process where they, each individual member sent the evaluation to one member to produce a document. Um, because apparently that is a question, that's the, that wasn't made explicitly clear, I don't think, by um, the open meeting logs. Voss. Um, I just wanted to bring it up because I think it's a it it's not clear to me that it's well I don't think it's the best practice but um, it, I'm going to leave it to everybody else to think to kind of say if they're comfortable with it and I'll go with it if others are comfortable with it but the idea of asking one school committee member to receive information on the same topic from all of us feels to me like deliberating because he's talking to everybody essentially. And I guess my solution to this is to just have it sent through a different entity, which, you know, I think the attorney general's website is consistent with what you're all saying. They're saying this happens, but it's not best practice. And I just want to recognize that. Okay. Um, I'll do a little re more research on that between now and then myself, just to brush up on this. Um, uh, Member Goldman, you have a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, this is the first time for um, members of the current committee where we're doing the survey with this way. And also it's a new survey, I mean, a new uh, evaluation process. And so please provide feedback so that we can continue to make um, this process more robust um, for the committee and the community. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much, Member Goldman. Um, are there any more questions about the superintendent evaluation subcommittee report? 
Okay, um, hearing none, then let's move on to a report uh, from the Budget and Property Committee. Um, as mentioned at the outset, uh, Member Busansky couldn't be with us um, this evening. Um, she did wish to at least announce or have us an me announce to the school committee that the um, Budget and Property Subcommittee would be taking up at, um, at their uh, upcoming meeting um, two issues that have been um, that, that, that have been under consideration for a while. One is the issue of pesticide use um, by the school district. And the other issue is the issue of electric buses and vans. Um, so she couldn't be with us this evening, but she did want to communicate that those were going to be items taken up at, um, at upcoming meetings of the budget and uh, property subcommittee. So, um, so that concludes reports from each of our subcommittees. And I'll now turn to the superintendent for both the personnel report and the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, the personnel report is in your packet. And so rather than um, orally reading something that you already have in your materials, I'll go right to my report. So with students in grades pre-K through eight, back to fully in-person instruction. And as we heard earlier, the high school set to resume fully in-person instruction on Monday, I can finally say that months of planning, improvising in response to a quickly evolving health and regulatory landscape and marshalling new material and human resources, such as contact tracers, such as air purifiers, to reopen our schools, we're finally getting back to the learning routines that provide our students with relief from the social isolation that's been so hard for so long for so many. We've also started our first round of contact of um, pool testing. In the first round, we had approximately 360 individuals and no virus was detected in any of the pools. As we continue to refine our process, we'll be, re we'll be moving the testing day for middle and high school students and staff to Mondays. The reason for that is that we found that it was just um, too much to try to do the entire district on one day. And so we feel that splitting up the pool testing into two rounds will make it a more manageable process. Um, the pool testing days for elementary students will remain on Friday. I'll also say that we're interested in getting participation up. If you haven't already done so, I'd encourage you to provide consent for testing using the information provided on the COVID-19 tab of the district website. Unrelated to pool testing, because as I said, all of our pool tests were negative, we have had to temporarily place two classrooms at Ryan Road into remote learning because more than half of the students in the classrooms were in quarantine. One of those classes has resumed in-person instruction. The other one is still closed. Um, this was not based on a suspected school-based um, contact, but uh, due to a potential contact occurring outside of the school. We've consulted with the Department of Education and the epidemiology department of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health on both of these situations. We did not meet the criteria for a cluster in a school setting at this time, nor do we fit the, rapid, the criteria for rapid response testing due to the small number of positive cases identified and the lack of connection between the two cases um, involved in the quarantines. Since my last communication about vaccination, which was just over a little 24 hours ago, vaccine eligibility has now been extended to students 12 and older. Northampton Area Pediatrics is partnering with the Northampton Health Department to immediately offer the Pfizer vaccine to patients 12 years of age and older. The Northampton Health Department's ongoing Hampshire County Regional COVID Vaccine Clinic is located at the Northampton Senior Center on 67 Conn Street in Northampton. Northampton Area Pediatrics highly recommends, as do I, that all patients aged 12 and above receive the COVID vaccine. The city's health department has planned to set aside times for pediatric patients during weekday after, after school hours and on Saturdays in the weeks ahead. The Northampton Health Department Hampshire County Medical 
Reserve Corps and the Northampton Fire and Rescue have a number of staff and volunteers with experience in administering vaccines to children and along with NAP providers and staff who will be volunteering at several of the clinics. The clinics have run smoothly and efficiently since the start of the vaccine availability and give, have given approximately 30,000 COVID vaccine injections since January 11th, including for young people aged 16 and older. And many Northampton area pediatric families have members who've been vaccinated there. If you have questions about the vaccine, the Amherst Public Schools has invited us to join, to join a town hall that'll take place next Wednesday. Guest panelists will be Dr. Kama Ennis, Dr. Peter Everett, Dr. Estevan Garcia, Dr. William Soares, and Dr. Lauren Westifer. I've also been contacted by Dr. Sandeep Shukla about the possibility of setting up another town hall organized for our district. Stay tuned for more information on that. We're also beginning to explore the possibility of partnering with the health department to provide mobile vaccine opportunities in connected to our emergency meal distribution. Uh, we began this, this meeting with a discussion of the successes of our meal distribution plan. We've already gone beyond distributing meals to students. All of those businesses that were mentioned in the proclamation as supporting our efforts, we're doing so to help distribute food to adults who are beyond the scope of our program. Now, obviously um, we don't have any sort of a, a vaccine capacity within our program, but we believe that by partnering with the health department and making vaccination available as at the food distribution sites, we may be able to, in a similar way, extend vaccination to other communities within our city. I don't have the professional background to discuss terms like herd immunity, but I have the common sense to see that it'll be harder and harder for the virus to interrupt learning as more and more members of our school community obtain immunity through vaccination. So we are pushing very hard to do everything we can to support the vaccination effort, um, not only for our students, but for their parents and everyone they come in contact with, because the more immune individuals we can build up within our community, this um, more, immune, I think our system will be to disruptions such as the ones that have occurred this week at Ryan Road School. Finally, I want to alert the community that we will need to bring a few adjustments to the school calendar for next year. Based on requests from high school staff, we'd like to move next year's turnaround day from 21st, where it is currently listed on the calendar, to January 28th. Also, while reviewing state law on holiday observance. We realize that because Juneteenth falls on a Sunday next year, the observance is Monday, unlike this year when it falls on Saturday and is observed on Saturday. So we will be bringing you a revised calendar that adds that holiday at the next meeting. And that's my report for this month. A couple of um, questions uh, probably sparked by your report. Three questions. Uh, first, Member Goldman. Member Goldman. Sorry, actually, my question, it was um, discussion oh, about, <laughs> hold on one sec, about um, budget, um, budget subcommittee. So I'll wait until we're completely done with the superintendent report, if that's all right with you. Okay, Member Levy. Thanks. I'm so excited by the idea of having mobile vaccinations and really, really applaud the, the, the idea. Um, just a quick clarification, are you suggesting that those mobile vaccinations would be for both students and other community members or only for students? So we are just in the um, beginning stages of this, but I actually think that it would be more likely to be an attempt to get vaccine out to the families rather than the students. Um, but I think, I don't think the students would be excluded from that. Um, you know, we have, we have other opportunities, I think, to get to students. Um, I do think that sometimes um, caregivers may find it a little bit harder to get um, to our center. So that's my initial thought on that, um, but it could be for students as well. Got it, thanks for the clarification. I'm really excited about that. You're welcome. Member Gold. 
Um, yeah, Dr. Provost, you said that you, uh, regarding the Ryan Road closures, um, that um, you consulted with DESE and DPH, if I heard correctly. Um, did they provide any feedback on our policy of closing the classrooms? Um, at the, I think because of the it reached the 50% quarantine, did they, did they have any input on that? They didn't have any um, input on the 50% rule, um, other than to say that they thought that that was rational, that it made sense if most of the students were in quarantine, that going to remote um, will, you know, was responsive to the condition that most of the kids were in. They did say that um, they would encourage the city to reconsider using six foot distancing for contact tracing and go to the three foot standard for contact tracing. Um, for me, I, you know, I will be talking to Meredith about it, but that one is a little bit hard, I think, for me to be firm about, especially since, as I said, these were contacts that were not related to school-based exposure. These were contacts that occurred within the community. And I feel, um, I feel that I just don't have the background to, to second guess the health department on, on how they want to define contacts that occur within the community. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other questions about the superintendent report? If not, then um, let's go back. Member Goldman, you had questions about budget and property subcommittee. I do, thank you. Um, I'm not sure what direction this will go in with member Busansky um, not with us this evening, um, but I have some concerns about um, after, uh, after school, programming for students. Um, I've been contacted by some families in le at the lead school, but I know that this it will be an issue for other elementary schools where, um, where in the past care has been provided after school. And um, when I, you know, I was a strong advocate for the late start and looking at the schedule change for the elementary schools. I'm I just wanna make sure that there are affordable care options for the schools, especially considering that they'll be getting out of school quite a bit earlier. Um, I think significantly earlier than they have in the past. Um, and families understandably will want to start preparing for that already. And so, um, I'm hoping for a discussion about it and potentially um, asking the budget and property committee to take this up as an issue as well. Um, member Voss is a, me is a member of the budget property committee, member Voss. Um, I'm more raising my hand just as sharing the same concern that we just heard. And I heard about this for the first time this week from a community member. Um, thank you, Member Goldman, for bringing it up. And I'm not sure where the problem, where the solution, what group needs to solve this problem, but I completely agree with you. We need to solve this problem. And the way it was portrayed to me, and maybe Dr. Provost can help with this, was more that it was a one year problem because of the extra tutoring that's going to be going on after school and the issue of having both programs particularly at Leeds at the same time. And um, I just haven't had a chance to, I just heard about this yesterday, so I hadn't had a chance to email about it. But since you brought it up, I just wanted to clarify that's the way it was explained to me. And maybe Dr. Provost can help us understand what the problem is and if it's more than one year and if it's just next year, how we can solve it. Sure, I can, I can speak to it. So this is a um, concern that's coming from Leeds um, because this is, this is the, one school where we have a district run before and after school program and they've been begun the process of trying to figure out what the fees for next year should be we have not heard from the why uh, i mean we have heard from them that they're interested in providing before and after school care but we haven't heard what the fees might be in the um in that setting i think that it's it's likely that there may be some offset with the why programs because i think there'll be less need in the morning and more need in the afternoon. And so that, that may, to a certain extent, balance out. But um, it's yet to be seen with that. With leads, there are a couple of things that are playing into this. Um, one is that the program 
essentially hasn't been running, I mean, has been minimally running for most families um, this year. So next year's, next year's tuition has to um, reflect two years worth of wage growth for the employees. So there's that. Um, there's the fact, and I would say that's probably the smallest amount. I would say that probably accounts for about 10% of the increase. The other piece is that the after school program will now have to provide an additional hour of care um, because elementary school will be ending earlier. And so um, that adds, I would say, probably about 40% to the increase. And um, the other the other 40% is coming into compliance with the school district policy on sliding scale. Um, one of the things that we realized as we began looking at what fees might be for next year was that the LEADS program was not in compliance um, because there's a policy the school committee has that very clearly says that students who are eligible for a reduced lunch will have a reduced fee and students who are um, eligible for free lunch will have no fee for any school program. And so in order to come into compliance with that, um, it means that the cost for students who are not eligible for those programs has to increase. So all in all, it's a $1 an hour increase in the fee um, and a one hour per day increase in the number of hours that people are, are serving. So I think that, you know, it's not a one year problem. It's a problem that all of the increases are going to hit in one year, but I do think that those would be built in moving forward um, unless there was some structural change either in the way the program was run, in the number of hours that it was run, or, or, or something like that. If, if you don't mind, I'll just follow up and just be sure to clarify that what I heard is not correct then, that the after school tutoring that's in place through the federal funding to help kids catch up is not playing a role in the problem of after school care for kids at Leeds. Is that accurate? Uh, that is accurate. And in fact, you know, that program may help to mitigate it because some students may be going to that tutoring instead and there's no fee attached with that. Thanks. You're welcome. Member Levy, you had your hand up. Thanks. I really appreciate Member Goldman bringing this up because I too share this concern and have been in a conversation with some community members about this. Uh, I will say that one of the reasons I'm most excited about sending my kid to Leeds is because of the robust after school program and because it's an in house program. Um, and I, I, but I'm not sure that this issue is going to be unique to Leeds because families sending their kids to the Y are also going to need to pay for an additional hour. Um, and I think, um, Superintendent Provost, you had answered some of my questions via email about this, and it sounded like, if I'm if I'm correct, that the cost is actually potentially fourteen dollars an hour for this program, which is uh, I think it was nine dollars an hour last year. So it's significantly higher. And um, my concern is that we are we're actually going to lose the families who don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, but can't afford that huge that huge increase. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to correct one thing because there is a mistake in that. It's 14, 14 to 18. That price jump reflects a per day rate, not a per hour rate. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Uh, and it's still a big jump from nine. Um, and so I, I, I think I would love to see us, I, I, I will share a little frustration that I did actually ask a question about this when we were considering changing the school start times to ensure that this was something that was thought of and taken care of. And, and I believe the answer was yes, we've already taken care of after school programming. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's a shame that we've already passed our budget and we can't add uh, funding to, to subsidize this. But I wonder if we as a district could find some funds. I wonder what the funds would be to, that would nece be necessary to subsidize this and whether we as a, a district could find that. And I would hope that we could subsidize that not just for LEADS, but for all of the element elementary schools. Member Gold. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to clarify something because, you know, and I know that uh, we, we might be hearing from parents um, now about this situation, but uh, there were members on the school committee when we were voting on late start 
that pointed to this very issue that we hadn't consulted the why yet. We didn't know how to address after school care. Um, and that's why we, there were members of the school committee who didn't feel comfortable voting on late start till this was resolved, till we had a solution to the after school issue for elementary. So that what it isn't, it really isn't something new um, since it was shared at that time. So I do wanna, I do know that parents though now, as they're looking into next year, are reaching out to us for sure. Member Boss. Um, I'm just wondering, Dr. Provost, so I can see where this might belong on the budget and property subcommittee, but it might be more urgent to not be on that subcommittee and be at a full committee level. And I'm wondering if it's appropriate to talk about how to subsidize after school experiences, I'll call them, because every child in our district lost a lot last year. And we do have money coming in to help, you know, catch them up. And catch up means more than just sitting down and reading and doing math. It means socializing and interacting with each other. And maybe there's a way to bridge to support that, really using that money in the way it's meant to, but also to bridge this conversation and figure it out. Um, so it's just a thought. So I guess I, I wonder wanna, where you I just, think this conversation. I just want to say that we have to figure out a way to either put it on a future full school committee meeting or a subcommittee because we can't really deliberate it on it tonight. So um, I'm not sure we can bring that to the um, to the agenda setting committee and try to figure out what the best way to proceed is. Um, Okay. Um, Can I just say, as a member of the Budget and Property Subcommittee, we don't have a meeting on our books, and I would advocate for putting it on our next agenda because it feels like something that need that has more urgency. Okay. Duly noted. Um, okay, so thank you, uh, Superintendent Provost, for your superintendent report. Um, we'll now... Um, move into new business. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is coincidental, but we have a discussion of preschool fee adjustments um, from our early childhood uh, staff, Erica Frank, uh, and Laura Frogamini, and I will turn the floor over to both of them. Thank you very much. And I will um, kick us off tonight. Um, my colleague Erica Frank is here, and we had significant support on the research and work on this um, on this issue with Pam Smith, who's the Northampton Public Schools Early Childhood Assistant and uh, Early Ch Childhood Consultant, uh, Barbara Black, and your former preschool coordinator for the district. Um, this is spurred and brought to you courtesy of your CPPI grant. Um, you may remember back before the pandemic, the district, um, thanks to Josh Dixon and Barbara Black and Pam Plummer and all the folks at Student Services brought us the Community um, Commonwealth Preschool Partnership Initiative Grant, which expanded uh, one of our classrooms to five days um, at Bridge Street School and this year um, to one at uh, Leeds. About three months into this expansion of preschool, uh, of course, the shutdown happened. So the idea of expanding preschool fees and updating the chart just kept getting pushed and pushed as we all um, dealt with the changing landscape of COVID. Um, so at this time, we're coming to you to get that five-day programming on the fee structure chart, um, to get the extended care program on the fee structure, we also would like to adopt a new sliding fee scale structure, which reflects the correction of actual hours of full day programming and the addition of families who qualify for a reduced lunch to the direct certification group. And um, we have a recommendation to increase the hourly rate a year from now. Um, you all received a memo on this, as well as the current fee schedule and the proposed fee schedule. But I'll just let you know the reasons for updating. Um, well, it's been a while, so that's important to always review our policies and procedures. It was back in 2013 when it was last updated. Um, as a recipient of the CPPI grant, we're required to offer that five-day programming, um, but we're also required to work on sustainability. So where is our funding coming from? How is it working? Are we running sustainable programs? Um, digging into that, we realized that 
there were some glitches around reduced lunch and that there were um, because reduced because the income levels of families who were falling in reduced lunch appear on the sliding fee scale chart. Some of them were opting into paying when they could have, there was glitches there. Um, and as um, the current scale also does not account for the actual hours. So when we went from offering full day, four day programming, uh, we doubled the hours that we charged for, but in actuality, there's an, it's six hours and not five. It's not two half day programs a full day program, we don't send the kids out and then bring them back in. There's six hours of programming there. So there are many ways to reduce fees for families. Um, and those are outlined in your memo. Families can, uh, when they're found eligible for integrated preschool with in, on their individual education plan, uh, their half day preschool is waived. Students, again, direct certification. All families may submit documentation for sliding scale. Um, and then families that do not pay a fee. So at this time, if you have questions for Erica and I, um, we welcome them. Your questions about this new fee scale. Okay, uh, member Seraphie Cox. I just wanted to say that I'm really excited about the expansion of, uh, of preschool. Um, that I think that that's, I mean, I, I'm sure that we all agree about the importance of early education. Um, so I'm just really excited that the, uh, that the district is going in that direction. And also um, happy to hear that sustainability is a, a key part of, um, of, you know, what the district is thinking about. Thank you. Any other questions? One of the important questions that Dr. Provost posed to us in the uh, research process was, was, hey, what's this going to do to income? You know, how, how is this working towards sustainability? And the beauty of the work that was done was that we were able to um, really eliminate and reduce fees for our most economically challenged families. Um, and then by adding programming you naturally pay for a little more, but with that sliding scale, we're able to keep it manageable. Um, and so we actually bring in slightly more um, than we would have. And by adding five-day programming um, annually and monthly, you will we will bring in more funds into the preschool programming, which we have ideas about. Yes. Member Voss. Member Gold. Sorry, I didn't do my virtual. Let's go for it, Member Voss. I'll go virtual. Okay. Well, thank you. I was really pleased to read this and I was happy to see us doing this. Um, one little question I have is I'm just sure. curious how the most expensive um, part of the sliding scale compares to um, other programs in our area. Is it more expensive? We are still one of the very lowest cost programs. Even for the, the highest cost. Which so. as we've moved into a preschool partnership with our community-based programs where we are um, in full partnership with all, one quarter of the children in, that are three and four years old go to the public schools. Three quarters of our children are, are educated and cared for in community-based programs. And as we're in partnership with them, it is concerning to be undercutting some of those programs um, when you think about the fees um, and pay equity you know we have the highest paid teachers with the lowest um, the lowest charges uh, you're the expert on all that I was just gonna share that was my sense of looking at the prices that even at yeah. the highest pay rate or, or tuition or what we call it um, it still felt like a really um, good deal. Super and affordable. I would just encourage us to make sure families who do have those higher incomes realize that, that they're still getting a really good deal. And maybe even as we go forward and the program grows, you can think about increasing some of those prices to support some of the really good work that's going on and some of these equity issues. But, I told yeah. Erica that I would say that I voted for a $2 increase 
for proposing a two dollar increase to the next year. Um, but I'll I'll just whisper that in your ears. Thank you. Thanks. Member Goldman. Thank you, um, Laura and Erica. Thank you so much for um, bringing this forward to the committee. I really appreciate it. And I've read through it in the presentation of the documents. It was very clear. You answered a lot of questions and it was laid out. It was quite easy to read. I appreciate that. Um, one section, one note here was that this was last, you know, the fee schedule was last updated for the fiscal year 2014. And um, you're bringing this to us now. And I'm wondering if you have a proposal for how frequently this would be updated going forward. Do you anticipate waiting another six years or? <laughs> I think it's going to really, I think it's really smart. If we can possibly pass that increase and get things set, we start fielding information and referrals from families October, November. So being able to have those prices out ahead of time and have that process clear. Um, things are going to change quickly with the money and attention that early childhood education is getting. If we can sustain it and get more money in, it'll be interesting in some ways to see where that money flows from. So right now with the CPPI grant, the money is flowing with EEC to the lead agency, the public school, which we are then sharing and, and subcontracting out to community-based programs. However, there may be a flip there where if this money, if more money is going to licensed programs, where we're license exempt and under DESE, you know, we're already talking to partners like, okay, we're able to fund this through these extra staff at your site for special education students now through this grant through the lead agency. But if more money starts coming you, your way and less money starts coming our way, like, and by being in partnership now with them, we're in a really good position for secure early childhood moving forward. Um, but depending on how that money flows and trickles out, we may be back to you more frequently than less. Um, that sounds great. Uh, really to keep adjusting um, because I know that this field is moving in a lot of directions right now, yeah. um, early childhood. And I've seen how the CPPI grant has benefited um, families, not only by making it affordable, but also providing care where the students are at and you know you are familiar with all the benefits so um do you expect to have the cppi grant continue we are renewed through um fy22 um and um it is it will be competitive for fy23 um it is this is not a grant for um like the cfce grant which is really as as my mentor and, and our consultant, Barbara Black says, it's baked in. Um, the CPPI grant is meant to be a transitional grant. It's meant to help us restructure what we're doing and make changes to what we're doing. That's why that sustainability, child outcomes, um, that student and getting those services and equitable, special education services equitably out to all the children in the community programs. Um, the state's committed to mixed delivery system um, so, you know, that's going to continue to be an important way that we educate young children and care for them. Um, but it's going to be competitive next year and, and we will have had it for three years. So I'm advocating that they look at uh, the nine communities that have it now as mentor communities and that we look at don't, don't move us over and move new people in to figure it all out because the work to figure out how to blend EEC programs with DESE programs was tough. And we've done, I'm so proud of our district because we've done really great work at that. It is, the details are, are quite quite excellent. Um, so I'm really advocating for weaning us off the funds and for seeing us as a mentor community um, so just feel free to keep spreading that around and um, talking to your DESE people about it as well as we advocate to the EEC folks. When you speak to how competitive it could be in the future, is that does that mean that we're out we would be outgrowing 
the grant that we wouldn't be able to come up with a new challenge that oh, qualifies. There's plenty of challenges. I know there's plenty, you know, there's plenty We're of- We're already working on it. If at some point, <laughs> great. We submitted the renewal um, April, April 29th, a couple of days ahead of the deadline uh, uh, in late April. And we are already strategically planning um, for the next round. That's yeah. great to hear. Thank you so much for your work on this, both of you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Member Gold. Um, yeah, curious to, to know, and I'm sorry if this was shared and I should know it um, as I was listening. Um, what portion of the expenditures is covered by the grant versus the, the income from the, the, the fees and the, and the tuition, so to speak? Like how much are, yeah, what, is there a way to, um, to figure, to explain that part? Um, so the fees are a very small portion. So annually, preschool fees have brought in between 30 to $50,000. 50 was a really high. Traditionally, it brings in around $30,000, which is covering like an ESP and a half. Right. It's, it's, um, it's not covering much. Yeah, and, and which that's what, you know, because so as our daughters went through the pre-K program, both mm -hmm. in, um, we're, with the whole sliding scale sort of along the, what member Voss was saying, you know, it's an amazing deal. Um, and I don't know how, we, you know, <laughs> if there's a way to place, make this scale not end, <laughs> you know, like the slide, you know, you know, for families or people in the community who want to, contribute to the great program. I think, you know, I think it um, it behooves us to figure out ways to increase that that part of the funding if possible. And, you know. We're digging in, we're, we're looking at it. Um, and, you know, some of the funding will come through special education because it's an integrated preschool program. That's, that funding is coming from those sources. And I'm sure Dr. Provost could do a better job of explaining all the funding spots as I'm, as I'm digging in as well to what that next round will look like. Um, but certainly the CPPI grant has brought in over $600,000 to expand and increase the quality and equity in our preschool programs in Northampton. And this will be the third year headed in with it. So. Thanks, yeah. great work. Mm -hmm. Thank I, Barbara Black. She keeps an eye on these grants. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Provost. Just, just to, um add or, or respond to what Laura said. I, I don't actually think I can explain it better than you can, although I can point out one thing that um, wasn't part of your discussion yet, which is some of the cost avoidance that we've been able to achieve by sending our staff into local providers. Um, yeah. So we've been able to provide services to a large number of students at a much lower cost by sending our special educators into community-based programs. Um, and that's one of the cost savings that I really think came through the CPPI program because we didn't, we weren't thinking in that way until we started blending not only ECC and DESE, but also blending public and private. Um, without that opportunity, I would be before you saying that we probably need to double the number of preschool classes in the district. And that would come with a significant cost you know, price tag. So it's not only, um, it's not only the cost of running the program itself that has to go into the final analysis, but it's some of the cost avoidances we've been able to achieve through the partnerships that we've developed with local providers. And with that, excellent, excellent piece there, but you, we also have to remember that it's these are community-based programs, which is, I, I will tell you, Dr. Provost, it is my preferred term, community-based programs. Private can also make, you might think that those folks are earning money um, or turning profits because um, they're not. Um, I could send you a million New York Times articles on it. Um, but also if we were to try to offer year round programming at the hours that these programs can for children at a very young age that need that consistency of care, um, so as opposed to a child in second or third grade who's gonna really love going to summer camps during the summer or having those other opportunities, 
for children in the three and four year old range, we really want them to have consistency of care year round, attachment, brain development, social development, all of those things are critical for them. So by doing something like sending itinerant special education services to the child, we're not just providing the services where they are, we're not prov just providing a benefit to the, to the family that their child has more consistent care. We're actually supporting their brain and body and cognitive and global development by allowing them to be in a consistent setting with consistent peers and consistent caregivers. Um, it's a win-win, win, win, win. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, any other questions, discussion about this? Um, um, we're not requiring a vote on this. This is just an FYI, correct? I think you have to vote on the new sliding fee scale and whether or not we can raise the rate for FY23, please. I think. Okay. Um, there is a policy that says all fees need to be approved by the school committee. Motion okay. to approve the new sliding fee scale. And the other part was... There's four parts. There's the addition of five-day programming, five-day programming with extended care, the new sliding fee scale chart, and an FY23 increase. One or two dollars. Is that your motion, Member Gold? It is my motion to approve those okay. four items. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Member Goldman and Member Fallon with a question. I mean, I guess I was just wondering, it, it's not posted on the agenda as a vote. Are we still okay voting for it? Well, that's why I was asking because it wasn't clear to me that it required a vote because there wasn't a vote on the agenda. I mean, clearly the public was noticed that there was going to be the discussion of these fees to, in front of the school committee. And so it was that certainly would not have been a surprise to anyone. Um, so I, I, I confess I did not know these were, uh, I did not know that these were. Um, and I, think the, I think it's the next agenda item we're gonna have a problem with too, I just realized. Let's deal with one problem at a time. Um, <laughs> Member Seraphie Cox, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, that was going to be my very same question as Member Fallon and uh, a follow-up question to that is, is this time sensitive and could we put it on our next uh, meeting agenda so that it can be adequately agendized if this is a problem. Um, when is it? Two weeks? I guess uh, to, to, to back up from that question is, uh, is our attorney available to give an answer about that? Or like whose who's say are we going to, <laughs> to look to to answer this question for us? Um, yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, I mean, the, the, the item was listed as a preschool fee adjustment. Um, and so, you know, it, it is true. We typically have, the, you know, you'll see item C, we have a vote on that, you know, that signals that there'll be a vote on the district improvement plan. Um, and those weren't part of the um, items A and B, though I believe in a vote is requested for those. So I, it's, um, yeah, I think it's it's really a at this point a, the school committee needs to decide what what, what it feels comfortable doing, and um, so our next meeting would not be um, until the second uh, June tenth, I believe. Is that the correct date for our next meeting? There's a meeting coming up in two weeks. Okay, um, the twenty seventh, correct? That's correct. Okay, so that there would be a meeting on the 27th. So would that create issues for you if it was uh, the vote took place then? Um, Erica, I, I would rather, I mean, of course we want it to go through yeah. as efficiently as possible for families, but I also wouldn't want it to go through and then get knocked off. Okay. Um, Erica, do you? Yeah, I mean, I. If it could happen tonight, that would be great. But if not, I think if it could happen in the next two weeks, because there are lots of things 
on the table in terms of preschool for next year that we're families are waiting to hear about, so. Okay, uh, member Seraphie Cox. Uh, I think my hand was still up from last time. Okay. Um, so uh, it sounds like out of an abundance of caution that folks would like us to defer this to the 27th where it can be noticed that we are planning to take a vote on these fees. Um, and so we will do that. It does sound to me that there's support tonight. If I had to, you know, read the room and and um, that I think that you won't have a problem with that. It, I think there's just more the concern about uh, making sure that we properly noticed what we were planning to do this evening. So, um, okay. so we'll put it back on the agenda. I, I don't think you'll. I think if folks have questions for you in the meantime, they can contact you. But I don't think you need to worry or need to come to the next meeting most likely um, and we should be able to post it properly and, and dispense with it uh, very quickly. Okay. Well, thank right. you both for being thank here. You. I want to thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you for your questions and support and I just want to give a, a big shout out to the district improvement plan team. I had the pleasure and honor of serving on it. Um, I will give a shout out for anyone out there in the community who ever wants to be on a district-wide committee. It's fantastic. You really learn so much and get to know amazing people. And this committee went so deeply and extended their work so long to make sure that um, it's a beautiful plan. And I, I hope that you'll be passing it tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Laura and Erica. So the next item on the um, agenda uh, involves a... Um, an FTE art teacher uh, and Principal Ballancourt is here. Um, so, Principal Ballancourt. Hi, thank you. Um, I too want to um, echo what Laura said about being a member of the district improvement plan. It really was a pleasure to be a part of the team. Um, and I have to say the whole, the whole, um, the whole piece of the work just really made me proud and it made me feel motivated to continue the work outlined in the dip. And I have to say that, um, you know, I just, I find that the goals are really aligned with a lot of the SIPs that the administrators in the district and our school councils worked so hard on in the beginning of the year. And that both makes me feel not, you know, not only proud, but like people are invested and thoughtful about all of the work that has been carried on throughout the course of the year. So I'm really excited for that presentation. And I too, Laura and everybody else, um, just had a really good experience being on the district improvement plan. But I also want to um, propose that our current 0.83 art teacher position be increased to a full-time art teacher position. And I'd like to have just a few moments to explain why we have that need. So as you all know, Northampton High School has a robust and really engaging visual arts program. We value as a community our art program and it's actually a graduation requirement at Northampton High School. So many kids to fulfill the requirement, they attempt to enroll in either a concepts and art class or a ceramics class to fulfill that role. Um, and really, I have to say, like it is incredibly attractive program. This year, we have 601 students who requested to be in some type of visual art class, whether it is a concepts class, a sculpture class, a drawing and paint class. And then we have a number of honors courses that help students prepare and build their art portfolio for college. Um, so again, we have 601 students who requested to be in a visual arts class. So based on our current staffing, we were only able to fulfill 264 of those requests for next school year, which you know you can do the quick math, but it, what that means is that 337 of our students are unable to enroll in an art class that they had hoped to get for next school year. Um, real quick, here's the breakdown. So 
The concepts of art class, we cap them at 28. Sometimes our teachers are reluctantly, yet agreeably willing to host 33 students in their class. It's not an easy yes, but they do it because they want students to have the experience. This year we have 220 students requesting the class. Based on the staffing we have, we can run three concept classes, but it still leaves 143 kids not able to get a concepts in art class. The concepts class is a prerequisite for many of the other classes, most all of them except for um, ceramics. And with the same trend, um, we had about 202 students request to take ceramics and we were only able to fulfill 40 of those requests. The ceramics classes, we can only serve about 20 students at a time just because the materials required and making sure that all students have access to those materials. So because we could only honor 40 of those requests and run two ceramics classes, we were unable to fulfill 139 students who want to take ceramics. So next year, um, we'll be replacing a veteran teacher. Her current position is 0.83. I mean, ideally, I would love to have three full-time art teachers, but I'm humbly requesting this evening that we at least um, begin by moving the 0.83 art teacher position um, and increasing it to a full-time 1.0 position. By doing this, it's not a miracle by any means, but we would be able to um, have an additional 25 students enroll in at least the concept of art class. So it would serve 25 more students by just making that position full-time. And Dr. Provost, yes. Dr. Provost. Um, and I don't actually think this item presents an agenda challenge because Principal Valancourt is not requesting to transfer any funds. Uh, I think the intention was to bring it before the committee so that if you have a full-time teacher in place of where you had a 0.83 teacher, um, we just have transparency in the school committee's consent to do that. It's the, the difference, it's the difference of going from a um, very veteran teacher at the top of the scale to someone who we think will be able to hire at a lower wage um, to, to allow us to add that other 0.17, um, which would be another class, which would allow many more of those students to take the courses they want to take. Member Voss. Thanks. Um, thanks, Principal Valancourt. I, I fully support this proposal. Um, it being here just gives me a chance in combination with reading the notes from several years ago that we approved earlier in this meeting just to highlight a little thinking. And like I said, I fully support this. We have so many students wanting to take these art classes and we should be offering it. It also just really shows, I think that some sometimes people in our community don't realize a lot of the high school classes are really packed and students are not always getting what they need. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we make future budgets. And this is one example, but there's others. And when the art requirement was originally proposed a couple of years ago, um, I learned about the Mass Core program, which is something that Desi says we should um, meet. And it says what classes, and feel free to correct me if I make any mistakes here, but it says what kinds of classes students should have to be essentially college ready. And um, this art is one of those requirements. And that was the main motivation for passing this. But our high school isn't meeting Mass Core program because we don't require the two um, classes in the same language because we're really not able to because of this exact same problem. And I just wanna highlight that for the committee for future um, to be aware that we have work to do in these areas and I'm glad we're working on the art problem. So thanks. Thank you. So are there any other questions? This is, so this is really just, you know, making the school committee aware, not asking for a vote of any additional money, but just the idea that um, you'll essentially be converting this position using the same amount of money that was already budgeted uh, by the school committee. That's correct. Okay, any other um, thoughts about this? Okay, all right. So thank you very much, uh, Principal Ballancourt, and hopefully you'll be able to fill that position. Um, I have a child who is a, a graduate of, who went through all those incredible art uh, classes and, um, and had a great preparation for her 
studies after high school. So it's definitely a popular and, and great program. So let's continue on in the agenda then. And the next item on the agenda is a vote, and we did notice that one correctly, um, on the district improvement plan. Um, and we have here tonight uh, actually four folks uh, listed as presenters, Lauren Brown, Megan Jewett, John Provost, and Andrew Samuelson. So not sure what the order of um, of speakers are, but I'll turn the floor over and let you uh, let you present. Thank you very much. We have the batting order. Um, Annie's going to start sharing. And I go first. Let me just, OK. So we come here tonight to present the result of a nearly year long process to envision a higher potential future for the Northampton Public Schools. We speak for the entire team who helped to crystallize these intentions for our future growth. The team included a diverse group of stakeholders, including member Kaufman, member Gold, and member Levy, three colleagues from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and 30 other members of our school community. Through the last district improvement plan, we work to forge a district identity and to establish unifying features of an organized system, such as a shared curriculum, district values, and a tiered system of supports. This plan extends that work, emerging in a time of heightened awareness of systemic inequalities in many institutions, including our public schools. This plan brings a clear intention and a strong focus on adjusting our system to create more equitable outcomes for all our students. Like all the work done in our district, this will require the coordinated efforts of many teams. And I have brought a team from the District Improvement Plan Committee to help me present the new plan for your approval. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleagues from the team who'll be joining us tonight. From Jackson Street School, we have interim principal Lauren Brown, from JFK Middle School, we have Megan Jewett, who is a parent and co-president of the school council. And the fourth member of our team is Andrew, Andrew Samuelson, who as our English language arts coach and mentor coordinator has a district wide presence. As we entered the first year, or, I'm sorry, as we entered the final year of our last district improvement plan, we were selected for a targeted district review. Under a 2008 state law, the Center for District and School Accountability, which was established as the successor agency to the Office for Educational Quality and Accountability, um, and under that law, the center is required to conduct at least 40 district audits annually. With a little over 300 districts in the Commonwealth, most districts receive a review every five to 10 years. I thought the timing was ideal. With an audit report coming out at just about the time we needed to develop a dip, I foresaw an efficient process of meeting to understand the strengths and weaknesses identified in the audit and developing a plan to remediate the deficiencies. With a head start from the district review, I thought we could write the new dip over the course of four meetings in about three months. It quickly became clear that the dip committee found that approach too rushed and too constraining. Our work ended up extending over 15 meetings and took most of a year to complete. Nevertheless, the plan focuses squarely on addressing one of the key findings of the district review, namely that quote, systemic structural and cultural barriers in recent years continue to interfere with the district's ability to ensure access, equity, and engagement along the K-12 curriculum. I think it's important that even though a conscious choice was made not to be bound by the findings of the district review, our team independently reached similar conclusions about the uh, importance of addressing systemic, structural, and cultural barriers in the district improvement plan. To preview the education trust results that I'll discuss, discuss next month, let me just say you'll be hearing this theme again as we review the responses to that survey. Whatever the process, 
be it an external audit, an extended discussion among our stakeholders, or survey methodology of the students and their families, we come back to the same conclusion, which is removing structural barriers to access and equity are the next most important priorities for the district in its efforts to improve. And so moving on, before we begin to unpack the highlights of the new DIP, I would like to just publicly acknowledge the members of the district improvement plan for their commitment to the process. As I mentioned earlier, this turned out to be much more than they bargained for when I first recruited them. Dr. Dr. Provost? Yes. I'm sorry, did, did you want, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you want Annie to show the summary one? Because it seems like you're going through the summary file and not the whole file. Unless no. I'm mistaken. No, we should be we should be back one. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think it's the uh, other file. There, you, there was two files in the folder for the dip. Oh. If I'm not mistaken, there, yeah, that really cool. Yeah. One shows everybody's name. So yeah, everybody part of it. Um, All right, forgive me. Let me try to find that. This one says the final district improvement plan. Yeah, there's one that says summary. Okay. In, the, yep. in that folder. Sorry about that. I just was. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because I was getting a little confused there. Yeah, it's a little bit above there. Okay. It was at the top of it, I think I noticed. Um, where was it? It's Google. It's different on everybody. There it is. Yeah, right in the middle there. Three under kiln. Right under kiln. There you go. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Is that correct? Is this the one that we were? Then this one has the slide with all the names on it. Yeah, makes yeah. more sense. Thank you, Ronnie. I was getting very confused. No worries. No worries. To download it. Okay, Dr. Provost, will you let me know if that yeah, is Can you correct? go one more? Can you go one more? Yeah. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good catch, Mr. Gold. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this, this turned out to be a much longer process than I had first envisioned. Uh, a diversity of identities was held by the members of the group, parents and staff, from the entire early childhood to secondary education continuum are part of the team. Representatives from general education, special education, English as a second language participated in the group, as well as parents from our special education advisory council and English learners parent advisory council. As I mentioned, we also had uh, three members of the school committee and three members from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education statewide system of support. Um, I'd also like to offer my special thanks to Northampton resident and former JFK middle school teacher and current interim superintendent of the Hampshire Regional Public Schools, Dr. Michael Sullivan, for his skillful facilitation of this entire process. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Brown. Hey, everybody. So this statement of intention really grounds the dip. And so I think it's worth taking a minute to take in together. So I'm gonna read it to you. As each student enters a Northampton school, dreams are nurtured, history and cultural heritage are celebrated, love of learning is fostered and educational, physical, emotional and social needs are supported. The Northampton School District is a community of learners committed to equity, and the success of each student. This commitment means that student success will not be predicted nor predetermined by race, ethnicity, caregiver economics, mobility, language, marital status, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, initial proficiencies, or religion. Anti-racism, anti-bias, and inclusive classroom practices promote an honest and brave culture of schooling, centering folks from marginalized communities where every student, faculty, and staff member is seen and heard. As a result, all members of our community will be highly invested in learning, with students demonstrating deep understanding of complex topics and actively engaged in transforming their lives and communities. The principle of equity goes beyond formal equality where all persons are treated the same. Instead, 
equity fosters an inclusive and barrier-free environment in which everyone will fully benefit. The district will apply this principle of equity to all caregiver and student engagement, instruction, curriculum, and systemic policies and practices. All students will have access to an opportunity for a high quality education. To that end, the district strives to create a learning, a learning community driven by anti-bias and anti-racist ideals in which we are able to proactively and reactively address incidents of bias, equity, and inclusion, empower and engage historically marginalized voices, increase the representation and participation of historically marginalized voices, disrupt dominant power structures and contribute to the dismantling of white supremacy, support and ensure the physical and psychological safety of students, educators, caregivers, and community members who are part of our BIPOC, AAPI, Latinx, LGBTQIA+, and other oppressed groups, and empower students to think critically about the messages they are receiving and be powerful contributors to change. Andrew, I pass it off to you. Thanks, Lauren. Good evening, everyone. I'm super excited to be here and to be sharing this uh, plan with you. Uh, through a process of collaborative conferencing, the team discovered that if we truly are going to commit ourselves to fostering equity and removing barriers, then this plan must reach across the multiple domains of our school district. After deep consideration, the team synthesized these domains into four categories or levers of change. They are caregiver, student and engagement, curriculum, instruction, policies and practices. As each goal is presented, you will hear about the work that is to be done in order to empower the underrepresented and to disrupt oppression within each lever of change in order to set the course for a new equitable journey for our community. Readers of this plan should note that alignment between this plan and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education District standards and indicators. Examples of this alignment are equity to access, curriculum reviews, data collection systems in use, sharing results, and supporting all students. We believe that this plan moves our district forward, laser focused on removing barriers for the least well served and improving the responsiveness of the Northampton Public Schools to provide the education that Massachusetts promises all of its children. And with that, I'll hand it over to Megan. Thanks. Um, so the first goal of our plan is to empower and engage caregivers and the community through classroom, school, and district collaboration that is culturally responsive and values anti-biased and anti-racist practices. While our current communication and information systems work for some of our families, other families experience challenges in getting the information they need and having the space to have their voices heard. This goal uses our levers of change that Andrew just presented to embrace practices that enlarge the circle of involvement and cooperation so that our engagement practices will work for everyone. Under this goal, the initiatives tend to fall into three types. The first types are initiatives to improve consistency across the district so that families will know how to get the information they need as their students move from grade to grade and school to school. These include things like developing consistent educated, educator home communication practices across a district and creating standards for school and district websites. The second type of initi are, are initiatives to broaden access and reduce barriers to information. These include things like ensuring public access to up-to-date curricula and using multilingual two-way communication regarding instruction. The third type are initiatives that create avenues for greater caregiver, student, and community feedback, input, and collaboration. These include things like empowering caregiver voices and decision-making about their child's experiences in school and partnering with area colleges and other community organizations for insight into curriculum. 
By broadening our engagement practices, we will encourage and establish a culture that promotes the importance of all staff building trusting relationships with all caregivers and our community. The second goal of our plan is to strengthen and sustain professional growth opportunities and collaboration for district employees with a focus on equity and anti-bias work in order to increase student engagement and mastery of content area standards, otherwise known as learning goals. Our journey towards becoming the district that we know that we can be does not begin with this plan. Many growth opportunities have already taken place and many are ongoing. And having been an educator in this district for eight years, I have been a witness to this work. However, with new learning comes new understanding. New understanding leads to <coughs> vision and purpose. As we focus on equity and anti-bias work across our levers of change, we will create stronger opportunities for the professional growth of everyone. A few of these opportunities include implementing ongoing professional development and culturally sustaining and anti-racist practices for all district employees, reviewing and revising our curriculum materials and resources based on the seven forms of bias protocol, creating reporting systems to assess how students are meeting goals, informing educator instruction and supporting students in a timely manner. And finally, provide collaboration opportunities throughout the year for educators within and across grades and between schools. Goal number three is focused on curriculum and instruction, which is at the heart of education. The goal reads, provide instruction and curriculum that empower all students to explore who they are, to embrace and honor the world around them, to identify and think critically about the messages they receive and to be powerful contributors to change. When I read this goal, I picture other educators asking themselves, does this goal align with what I know children need? Does it support my vision for my classroom as a space where all kids learn a ton about themselves, about the world and about their power and their place in it? I picture caregivers asking, Will my child's experience at school be meaningful, personalized, supported, and appropriately challenging? And I picture students wondering, will I be safe and seen at school? Will school be interesting and fun for me? I want the people who read this plan to see the work that they want to do or to be done for them reflected back at them. And this goal provides the opportunity for the answer to all of those questions to be yes. The last strategy under caregiver and student engagement says that one of the ways we can achieve this goal is to celebrate student work and learning in ways that center and illuminate the learning process rather than the product. Focusing on the learning process helps students understand themselves as a work in progress. It helps them internalize the learning process rather than be focused on a particular outcome or product that is fleeting. It helps students learn more about themselves as learners, and it makes learning more meaningful, more impactful, and more interesting. Another way that we hope to achieve this goal comes under the third bullet, is the third bullet under instruction, and it reads, empower students to take responsibility for their own learning and joy at school. Joy at school, I love that. If students know their own minds and have internalized what it feels like to learn, they can be in charge of their own learning. And student-centered, student-driven learning is by nature more differentiated and supportive, and it's authentic and fun. The first bullet under curriculum says, develop and implement a clearly articulated, research-based, culturally relevant, and anti-bias curriculum. There's a lot to that. The purpose of a curriculum that is clearly articulated and research-based is to teach all the kids all the things, and that's important. Curriculum that is culturally relevant, anti-bias and anti-racist will open the door for students to be empowered to take what they've learned at school and use it to implement change and make a more just and beautiful world. And that's also really important. 
Connecting students to their power is at the heart of this goal and it's at the heart of this plan. And so I'll talk about the fourth goal. The fourth goal is to address the current inequity of educational resources through a data-driven framework of strategies that provide equitable outcomes for students. This goal reminds us that an important intention of this plan is creating greater outcome equity for all students. It means that the strategies for interrupting the systems that have produced the inequalities we find in our district should result in the closing of racial achievement gaps. The power of data to illuminate the historical inequalities of our system is unparalleled. Grounding the work in our data ensures that our work is responsive to the needs of our students. There are many districts engaged in equity work at this time. We want the community to know that we're not just doing this to go along with the trend. We want the community to know that we are engaging in this work because our data shows us that we should be engaged in this work. Um, knowledge of local data enables us to tie these efforts to the local context so that we're able to show our own community that we are trying to get better at ensuring that all of the students the taxpayers send to our schools get a fair outcome. For example, grounding this work in the data allows us to say improving reading practice is critical for racial equity because 40% of our current Latinx third grade students are at risk for reading problems as measured by our winter screenings. And so those are the four goals. I wanna talk a little bit about implementation. Early in this process, I shared that the DIP team should outline broad strategies with only a limited attention to tactics that might be subject to change in response to unforeseen future conditions. I shared and the, present and the facilitator shared many examples of other district improvement plans, including the nationally acclaimed North Clackamas County plan that can be printed on a single sheet of paper and is just 231 words and the Cambridge Public Schools Plan, which is also a shorter document with five objectives and 22 initiatives. Our plan has four goals and 69 objectives, which is a lot of detail. But after having put months into the plan, I can honestly say that our group could not find a way to make it any shorter. Sequencing, implementing, and monitoring the ob objectives will guide the work of our alt, alt team over the next three years. Here you see an excerpt from a draft timetable for DIP implementation. I share it as a way of illustrating how the DIP will focus the work of all school employees over the next several years. Here you see implement st implementation steps and information on the progress reflected um, in the timetable. You will see more information and see it uh, reports on progress reflected in other district documents, such as the school improvement plans, educator evaluation goals, and my regular reports to the committee. Since the school improvement plans align to the district improvement plan, and since one of the goals of this plan is to raise up voices of others in the district, we sought out feedback from the various school councils. As I ask for your approval of this plan, let me leave you with some input from the school councils. From Ryan Road, the council said, this is reported by Principal Madden, they thought it looked good, they liked the format. They wondered about whether it was a one year or three year plan, they realized that was not listed anywhere. They thought the goals were lofty and that we would need at least three years. There was one question about why all the goals focus on equity, but another member of the group said that everyone improves when you improve equity. From the Bridge Street Council, this is looking strong. I wonder if goal one needs a curriculum line that is right in there now in goal three, which would be quote, to develop and implement a clearly articulated research-based culturally relevant and anti-racist, anti-biased curriculum. I can see how that might be unneeded, however, as the goals overlap, but it felt missing when I read through goal number one. 
also from Bridge Street. Exciting to see how much of the dip is focused on equity. So much great stuff here and clearly a ton of work went into it. Another um, response from the Bridge Street Council. Since there is such a heavy and wonderful focus on caregiver engagement, I was wondering if there could be a mention of the need for school council meetings and other school outreach informational events, town halls, specific communities that families are uh, invited to join, et cetera, occur after work hours. I think this is a huge part of making those forums accessible to more people and not just those who have flexible work schedules. Also from Bridge Street, I love seeing a focus on ensuring policies and practices are in place to recruit and retain educators of color. I didn't see any mention of restorative practice. Maybe I missed it though. I know the district included a mention of restorative practices in the new code of conduct and that it would be part of a school process in the future. When done well, restorative practices are not just about responding to to misbehavior, but about creating an entire school culture and climate that is centered around equity, community, and communal responsibility, and a broader definition of learning. From Leeds, I'm excited to see how much equity has been woven into the plan. Would like to see restorative practices named more explicitly in the document. Uh, suggestion to change the reference to transphobia to genderism. And it's an explanation, people are moving away from phobia language because phobias fall under mental health disorders and does not focus on the systemic nature of oppression like isms more accurately does. From JFK, I'm particularly exciting about, excited about seeing cross school educator collaboration and peer visits included, as well as the inclusion of teacher and student reflective practices. At the same time, it's not clear how that looks like and a substantial emphasis on teacher development will likely be needed to make it happen successfully. I'm not sure how that can happen, especially in the reality of contractual agreements, which make a lot of professional development a choice rather than a requirement. How does the district plan to assess efficacy in ensuring that all students share skills and implement them equitably? How will those learnings be reasonably allowed time and practice they need to go deep? from Jackson Street Council. This looks fabulous, even after just a cursory look. The glossary itself is an education. I think it's great. As long as it leads to actual concrete changes, it will be fantastic. My concern is that we do things in a talk heavy way without action, but this seems like a strong first action. I'm thinking about the SIP and how these other two documents these two documents inform each other. The SIP can help support the DIP while the school maintains its focus on keeping the children and the community at the center. It does speak to our school. It centers equity, anti-racism, ELL learners and parent involvement. It will help us tighten up the SIP and make it happen in all, our, all of our schools as much as possible. I like how it was set up. It was very easy to follow. I would note that it could concern itself with the rise of an authoritarian China or climate change or media literacy. There are many things it doesn't address. I'm just curious. I have the same feeling about the SIP and I'd like to bring those into the conversation. Still from Jackson Street School, the first three goals make sense and align with each other. The fourth goal seems like it came out of nowhere. I don't understand what it's getting at. The fourth one doesn't seem as consistent with the vision. The fourth goal seems like it's about explaining the process to caregivers, but there doesn't seem to be space for a dialogue and engagement with caregivers. And then from the high school, uh, a suggestion was made to add EL parents to the second bullet point in the first column. I think that was on goal four. This initiative talks about educating parents about the specific rights afforded special education children and their families they uh, and they thought the aspirations it expressed in the preamble were great but were concerned that it could be interpreted to meet that we had already achieved the goal of equity instead of needing to work on it or seeing it as a vision that we're working towards they appreciated the wording and the organization of the document they also appreciated the focus on data and measurability especially in goal four they wondered if goal four could include a measure of the effectiveness of engagement efforts. Um, 
Also, they, at the high school, there was an expression of many concerns that the high school counselors do not work directly with students and that there's a lack of a counselor-student connection and that this is a source of inequity that should be addressed. There was also a concern that too much emphasis was put on pushing students into college preparatory experiences and not enough on expanding supports and programming for students who did not want to go to college immediately after finishing high school. They also wanted to make sure that staff were trained to engage in restorative practices. And finally, I would just like to share the feedback that we received from Joan Tuttle, who is the director of the Central Western Regional Assistance Center for the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. She was one of the thought partners listed in that document. And she said, quote, I just have to say, wow, this is an amazing, thoughtful plan. Kudos to everyone who contributed for the past 10 months. While you invested a lot of time in this plan's development, I hope you all think it was worth the investment. Again, very impressive work. And so that's the feedback, that's the plan. And I would really appreciate it. And I would say that every member of this team who's put so much of their, themselves into this plan, when you add it up, it was more than 900 person hours of all of the individuals involved to bring this to you tonight. Um, and we, I, on their behalf, I, I strongly advocate for your acceptance of the plan so we can get to work on implementing it. Thank you, Dr. Provost, and to the other members who presented. Um, I will um, open it up to questions. I'll also entertain a motion just to put it on the, t on the floor if someone would make a motion. Um, Member Gold. Um, thank you. And um, thank you everybody for the presentation. It's, it was really awesome and spoke to the great work that went, went on. Um, so I'm gonna make a motion. First, I want to briefly explain what my, the background behind my motion. Um, and so first, uh, as a member of the district improvement plan team, um, while I was unable to attend all the meetings, I did participate throughout the process and um, I felt lucky to be a part of it. I can attest that the dip before us uh, comes as a result of a thorough process, many hours of thoughtful debate and a broad range of stakeholders were involved. Uh, these four goals and their accompanying levers of change um, will be great guiding lights to help NPS grow. Um, my, I will be making a motion though to postpone our vote for the following three reasons. First, as I hope uh, many of my fellow uh, dip members recall, um, that um, I repeated a need for our goals uh, that I shared during the process that we need to ensure our goals are measurable and that we um, es essentially have a rubric of sorts that can assess our, the dip's progress. This comes from my experience as a public school teacher where we annually set goals that align to the seven components of the SMARTY goals, um, which include the goals of being measurable, timed, and tracked. Additional time by postponing will allow us to add measurable indicators and ensure our goals are SMARTY aligned. My second reason for postponement is that uh, goal one sets forth a commitment to engage and empower our caregivers. And this, is a, this engagement is a theme throughout all the goals. Uh, while I do appreciate hearing from the school councils, by postponing, we can ensure that our DIP development process aligns to this goal and, and reaches out to all caregivers as much as possible. And my third reason um, to ask that we postpone uh, this vote is to take time to ensure that school and student academic growth and achievement and specific indicators for school and student growth and achievement are embedded within these goals, which I think goal four would be an appropriate place for, to include this. Currently, achievement only appears within the glossary of the DIP, but it's not actually addressed within a goal. And so I moved to postpone tonight's vote until our August, uh, sorry, July meeting, so we can one, align our DIP to the DESE SMARTY goal standards, two, provide time to effectively elicit feedback from caregivers, and three, to include student academic growth, school and student academic growth and achievement within our DIP goals. Was there a second on that? There has not been a second. Oh, a second. Okay, there's a second on the motion. So, um, are there any questions, Dr. Provost? Do you wish to respond to the motion or, or add anything to it? 
I think you've heard from a lot of people tonight that they support this dip. Um, I really worry about what the message of a postponement would send to them. I personally would feel very disappointed in crestfallen um, because those th it's true, it's true what Member Gold said that he did bring up those points many times in the conversation. Um, and I would think that I could even say that on some of those points I would be aligned. However, this is the plan that the group wanted. This is the plan that came from that process. And I feel that I have to, in good faith, represent this plan, not a modified plan or a different plan. Remember Levy, you have your hand up next. Thanks. Yeah, I um, actually was going to ask a question about metrics. I will um, share with the group that I also was a part of the, the district improvement plan committee and very much enjoyed the process and my time and the conversations that led to this document. And I'm incredibly excited about this document. I have two questions about it though. One is um, I was surprised that our final document doesn't, nor does the, um, the draft implementation plan, which I hadn't seen before, um, it doesn't include metrics. And to, to member Gold's, one of member Gold's points, I'm wondering how do we bring transparency to that? I'm not sure we need to go back and revise the actual plan, but perhaps the draft implementation plan uh, could be more clear about specific metrics that would accompany each of the goals. So I have a second question, but I want to start with that one. So I think specifically with the achievement metrics that member Gold was referencing, we do receive those from the Department of Education. Um, we have a number of targets for achievement that we're held accountable to on a yearly basis, both at a school level and at a district level and for individual subgroups. Um, so I do think that there's a tremendous amount of measurability around that. Right, I'm sorry, I don't mean those kinds of metrics. I mean, how do we articulate? I think we need to articulate and ensure that every single goal is, is measured that we have that we have effectively accomplished the goal, that the that the action items that we've set out are the correct ones, that they have moved our progress forward. So how are what are the what are the measurements that we're going to use to ensure the efficacy of the goals, of the action items to achieving the goals? So I, I, I those are two separate things, um, and I think these are the differences between goals one through three and goal four. Um, goals one through three, as I view the plan are mainly about steps to, to remove barriers for success for students and goal four is about what are the outcomes of all that work to re remove barriers so i think you have two separate kinds of measures one is is a measure about how effectively have we done what we said we were going to go out to get do so for example one of them is about adopting a district-wide standard for the website so in that implementation plan there's a time where it comes up and we can report to you on a standard has been adopted or it hasn't been adopted and what what percentage of the district website has been converted over to the new standard right but that's actually not the goal that's one of the action items to achieve the goal the, and I'm not, which goal is that, is that one connected to? I believe it's goal one. So yes, goal it's goal one. one is, if goal one is to empower and engage caregivers in the community through classroom, school, and district collaboration that is culturally responsive and values anti-bias, anti-racist practices, what measurements are we going to use to ensure that we have empowered and engaged caregivers in the community through blah, blah, blah? All of those action items, that's like a checklist. Did we do it or did we not do it? But we need to be able to articulate metrics that say, this is how we're gonna measure to what extent we've empowered and engaged our caregivers and the community and so on. And, and I think if we don't articulate those, those metrics that we're doing a disservice because we need to be able to say, we're going to determine whether these action steps that we've articulated are the right ones 
to accomplish this goal. And we need to be able to report on our progress, not of the action items, but of the goals themselves. The action items, it's like either we did it or we didn't. But did they help us achieve our goal? And where are we with regard to that goal? Again, I'm not suggesting that we go back and create a new plan. I'm suggesting that this plan be accompanied with a robust metric system that articulates that. And I'm not sure if that speaks to one of, of, of um, member Gold's issues or not, but I, that's something that I would like to see accompanying what I see as an incredibly robust plan, if I do say so. Does that, is, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I do hear what you're saying. And I think that just to stay with the example of caregiver engagement. So if you look through the implementation plan, one of the things that um, we've been starting to talk about as an alt team is a um, engagement team and engagement plan that's working on an engagement survey, which could be a way of measuring whether or not we're making progress with caregiver engagement. And there are lots of things like that in the, I mean, I only gave you a sample of what the um, timetable looks like, but there's lots of items like that embedded within. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good example of what I would want to see not embedded within, but made, in, but made explicit to accompany this to say, how are we going to measure this? We're going to put together a survey for caregivers and we're looking for A, B, and C in that survey and so on. And I would want to see that with each goal. So my second question is, um, it's, it's along the lines of one of the pieces of feedback that came from one of the, the school um, councils which is, um, I was really excited to be a part of thinking about professional development and, and embedding that into the plan. And yet I'm questioning, is that, are we capable of doing that with our current agreement in terms of the, the limit to professional development? And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about an approach to ensure that more professional development is built into the structure of, of planning moving forward and programming with, with educators moving forward? And how do we ensure that we're able to do that given what are at least our current limitations? So I, I think it's important to remember that this is a three-year plan. We'll be entering into contract negotiations next year. One of the, the most important um, goal that the administrative team had in the last negotiations was to get more professional development time, but that did not materialize. I, I strongly suspect that one of the most important goals of the of the, the management side of this negotiation will be to create more professional development time because I do think it's needed not only for these goals but also for many goals that are um, many other goals that we would have. Yep, I agree. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Member Kaufman. And again, there's a motion on the floor right now. So, um, Member Kaufman. Sorry. Um, yeah, you know, I'm 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 just going to talk. I know I know that there's a motion on the floor, but I think that I just need to say a couple of things. I wasn't planning on saying anything tonight. I've expressed my concern to Dr. Provost privately, but I had every intention of voting for it. But now that I see my two colleagues are raising the same concerns I had. I feel, <laughs> I feel uh, motivated to say, I mean, I, I do think that I agree with, with at least one of Member Gold's concerns. I think I also agree with Member Levy's potential solution, uh, Dr. Provost. If there was, I think, more, maybe a next step to talk about how we're actually going to do this work and more so how we're going to know we made a difference by providing some metrics, then I'd feel great. Because I think what we have is some pretty general, uh, lofty and worthwhile goals to shoot for. But when I look at examples, and I'll just, I'll just look at goal number one, um, one of the things says develop consistent educator home communication practices across the district. Um, that could be done, but I would know, have no idea why we're doing that or what we're hoping to accomplish from that or why we would even want consistent practices when we have such diverse families and whatever. So there might be a wonderful reason for that, but I wouldn't know what we're gonna do with it or why, or how to know if, made a difference as a result of doing that. And I think I can go through here and probably pick out about half of these things that sound like good things to shoot for, but I honestly felt like I wasn't gonna say anything because 
they're so vague and ambiguous that there's no way we can even do them. And the other ones were pretty solid. So I was okay with that. But now I'm just thinking that unless there's a plan to actually implement some, some um, I don't know, structure, logic, um, meaning behind so many of these things so that when we do them, we know why we're doing them, we know where we currently stand and we know that we've made a difference. Um, maybe it's worth spending more time. And I do greatly appreciate all the efforts that people have put in. I do think that we somehow got away at some point and there was a minimal number of folks that were involved in this that took it to another level. And um, I don't wanna to cast too much blame, but I, I do think that the facilitation we had and where we were going with it was not clear. I think we raised that point early on and we've reached a point now where it looks fantastic, it reads fantastic, and I'm not sure that we can accomplish anything and be proud of it because it goes in so many different areas. So I guess I would support, at this point, I would support Member Gold's notion. I would hope for a little bit more clarity in what he's looking for, but I do feel like we can do much better and I think we uh, need to do better. And I do apologize for letting you down if this is what it's doing, Dr. Provost, but I was a part of this team and I felt like um, it kind of drifted away at some point when it really needed to come together. And I too am disappointed with that. Member Fallon. Thank you. Um, so I actually was gonna bring up something that really member Kaufman just illustrated my point perfectly as I appreciate the fact that there was outreach done to the school councils. Um, but the fact that you were reading individual comments from individual members, that doesn't represent to me the support of the school council in the same way that, that member Fallon approves of something does not in fact voice mean that the Northampton school support, the Northampton school committee supports something. And so I think that, you know, the, the fact that even our, one of our school committee members said, I wasn't going to say this, but then they said it and it inspired me. I think that's the importance of having these conversations by um, elected bodies or, or public bodies that are required to be held in open meeting is because that dialogue in fact is so rich. And so the reason why I seconded the motion to um, hold off until July is looking at the city meeting calendar. It doesn't appear that any of the city count the school councils had the opportunity to meet as a group. And that's the dialogue that I think is so important. And to give the feedback in a way in which if there, if there was something that the group felt very strongly that needed to be prioritized, that we were in fact being um, upholding the very um, principles that we're saying are important to us in this document, that we want to engage our stakeholders and respect them and value their part in this process. And so that was why I was supporting postponing this. I think it's, I, I, I love, I love the direction it's going. I appreciate all the work it's going, but I would really like to um, to honor the process and to allow our school councils to, to meet as a group and to get more stakeholder feedback. Member Serafi Cox. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I um, am, was really excited to see the um, the focus on diversity and equity, and um, and to have it reflected um, in both the goals and the details, um, because I think that so often it can be a standalone goal and not um, actually baked into uh, to everything that's going on. When in fact we know that inequity is literally baked into everything that we do in life. So um, I really want to appreciate that um, about uh, the committee's work. I, um, I am going to be supporting uh, Member Gold's motion. I um, don't do it to make you crestfallen, Superintendent. Uh, and I also don't do it to in any way um, um, downgrade the work of uh, of the the committee that brought this to us because I think that it is uh, that it is nearly there. Um, but I um, 
uh, I, I, I fully support what uh, member uh, Levy was talking about in terms of uh, knowing when we get there, because um, the way that it's written now, we could do a little bit and or a lot and have in both instances be able to say that we have achieved the goal in some respect. So I guess I would uh, like, I don't know if it, um, you know, I, I feel like Member Levy had some really specific ideas about uh, about how those goals could be um, could be augmented with uh, with milestones or um, or um, spectrums of achievement, something like that. Um, so I'll you know I'll leave it up to the folks who have been working on this for so long to kind of augment it. So I I I don't necessarily see this as a it, it's certainly not for me. This is not a rejection of this plan. I, I do support these goals. Um, I want to augment the plan with this uh, this other um, support for the school committee to be able to, uh, you know, three years down the road, there's going to be, we, we just heard earlier in this meeting, there's going to be some new members on this committee. And so um, I think it's going to be important for the future committee to uh, to be able to uh, understand how to evaluate the district's um, um, progress on these incredibly important goals. So everything that's here, I want to say yes to, and I want to add to it this other uh, piece about uh, measurability. Member Gold. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify or re reiterate that um, I fully support the four goals that the dip came up with that I think that they're incredibly important and valuable guiding lights. My motion isn't to say to, that these four goals aren't acceptable or anything like that. It's simply to say that now that we've arrived at what these four goals are, I think it's before we approve of the plan that we do add um, and align them to the smarty goal idea of where they're measurable, where there's a timetable. Um, and I think that um, considering the pandemic that we've been in and what the district has been going on, 10 months does not, you know, it sounds like a lot, but I think, you know, people work tirelessly to make that happen. And um, a couple more months, you know, it's not going to be the work where we had to, you know, where we, we spent trying to figure out what the goals should be, but rather how do we just add some, um, some, a couple pieces to it to make it really strong that, you know, we can look back at and sort of essentially have a rubric on three years from now to, that we could look at and say, how did we do, you know, uh, what was our progress? And so um, that's really all the motion was intended to do. I, it is, uh, the four goals are spectacular. I love them. I think it's uh, a testament to the great work of the team. And it's just an, a little bit more time would would uh, be beneficial if we were adding those other, those three things I was mentioning. Member Boss. I'm just going to echo what we've heard and say, when I read this, it, it's beautiful. It's aspirational. Thank you to those of you who found time during COVID to put this together. I'm blown away by it. And um, I'm so proud to be part of a district that came up with these goals. And it make it, I don't want you to leave thinking that we've, that I or others feel otherwise. Um, but listening tonight, um, I want us to do what other members have said, and I won't repeat it all, but we need to make sure we do this stuff. And it feels like just a little more work to make sure we have these kind of metrics or SMART goals um, gets us there. And so I really hope people, if, if we vote to move forward with the, what's currently um, proposed, that people don't think that it's not supported or that it's not appreciated because it absolutely is. Um, thank you. It, it's amazing. Dr. Provost. I, I want to thank everyone for their feedback and their comments. I want to assure um, everyone that when I meet with the team, if this motion is to be successful, that I'll present it in the best possible light. Um, 
I do have to say what I think the emotional impact will be, you know, listening to this conversation, I'm feeling like one of my many conversations with my dissertation chair, where I brought forward another chapter and was told there's stuff here that's good, but go rewrite it. Um, there is, there's a process there, um, no matter how, how you couch it. So I feel like I would have to do that out of respect for the people who've put so much time into this plan with all of them and give them an opportunity to work through the process of um, producing what you're saying. Um, I've already sort of tipped my hand a little bit in that I, my concern is that it's too detailed, right? So now we're talking about um, rubrics potentially on 69 different initiatives. I don't think it's reasonable to have that done by July. I, I think that we're going to need more time. So if it if this does pass, I would I would just ask that the July time timeline be flexible. Um, um, Megan from the team, uh, you have your hand up next. Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to just put out there that. Um, schools are trying to work on their school improvement plans that are supposed to be coming out of the district improvement plans. And just in terms of thinking about the timeline, um, we we need a new one at the JFK. Our, we're currently, our, our, we, we, we're, we're trying to come up with our working on our school improvement plans. So if we're thinking about delaying things on um, the actual approval of this, I think there needs to be some thought in there for um, principals and school councils that are, trying to come up with school improvement plans that are tied to this district improvement plan. And um, I mean, we're at our meeting next week, we're gonna be trying to take what we got out of this district improvement plan to start thinking about our school improvement plan. And, you know, over the summer, cause we're hoping to have something in place for next fall. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm also concerned that it may take longer than July, possibly given how long it took to get this. Um, so I just think in terms of this motion, it doesn't necessarily need to be part of the motion, but if we're delaying things, we need to think about how we're going to communicate to school councils and principals who are working on their school improvement plans. Um, you know, should we just still work with what's out there knowing there's going to be more stuff or, or something like that? Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Jewett, for your comments. It aligns a little bit with my inquiry, which is if, um, if there were to be a delay to supplement the district improvement plan um, with some measurable goals, uh, who would do that work and, and when would they do it? Um. From my perspective, it would have to be the team. I, I mean, I think after working 10 months, I can't just with, you know, you know, by myself or with a small group of people come back and say, okay, here's a whole addendum that you've never seen before. I think it would have to be the same people who um, helped to get it to this point. Yeah. And I will say, of course, it is not looking for measurable or, um, goals or metrics for all 69 points. It's, it's just the four goals. We're just looking for, uh, uh, from what I'm hearing, a short checklist for each of the four goals. And um, having, for example, it sounds like you have a full or uh, a full working in progress implementation plan put together. Um, and so I, I wonder if actually you already have these pieces. And I do appreciate the distinction between the district improvement plan and the school improvement plans. I think it's really important to highlight that, that the district improvement plan shouldn't be a school improvement plan where a lot of these um, details come into play. Um, so the district improvement plan wouldn't need, uh, the goals wouldn't need to be so detailed, but um, but just some measurables on that. I wonder if this already really exists in the implementation plan and we didn't receive any implement implementation um, documents in our packet. So I think 
that that was noticed that 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 piece wasn't there. Thank you. Member Kaufman. Sure, um, Dr. Provost, is there um, what Member Goldman was referring to, what she called an implementation plan? Is there an additional plan that was developed? That is developed. There is a draft one that addresses all um, 69 initiatives and sequences them over the next three years. What does that consist of? Maybe that's what we're missing here. I don't think I've seen that. Uh, I could share my screen. Is that getting at what we're talking about, do you think, or not? I don't want to push us in a, in a different direction. Well, maybe if I share with you, the, the easiest way would be for you to tell me whether or not it's what you're looking for. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to share this. So this is color coded by the four levers in the four years. So we're looking right now at year one here. The pink things are the caregiver and student engagement items. You can see some of them are things that have actually already been done. Um, and then it goes on to the instruction pieces. Can, so there, there are pieces from all four goals that, you, that we'd be working on in each of the three years. So if, you, if you think about it, some of this is, um, some of this is sort of has a, a, a sense of prepotency, some of the things that make sense to do before you do some of the other things. Um, and that's, yeah. that's how this is set up. So this is year one, this is year two, this is yeah. year three. It, that's, that's what we have so far. Thank you. Yeah, and who set that, who set this up? So I have done this um, as a, in preparation for my next alt team meeting. The plan is to go over this with the alt team, see what they think about it, maybe reorganize it. Um, but it's it's what I foresee as the next step after we have an approved yeah. district improvement plan. Okay, so I do think that fills a part of the hole that I had seen and, and maybe others as well in terms of how to, how to actually go about doing this. So thank you very much. I think that was appropriate to share. So if we're missing goals, and I think there's some discussion about different goals, but can you foresee um, looking at the, um, targets, excuse me. So can you foresee looking at these goals and some of the avenues of implementation that we're planning to do and come up um, and say, you know, in three years, what we're hoping is that every student graduates or 95% of the students graduate on time or the MCAS scores this or the dropout rates that or, and those are big ones. Um, but it kind of forces you to look at the data and it forces you to say that all these issues that we're bringing up are actually issues because the data shows it. And I know you support that, but some of these things, again, it's so hard to grasp what they're trying to accomplish. And I think if I sat in a meeting, I would fully embrace it. But um, is there a way we can look at some of the data that is behind these goals and say, as a result of this, we will see evidence such as these data changing or these reports from parents coming in differently or these um, these are the kind of things. Do, can you foresee data aligned with the kind of changes we have put in place? Yes, and that line of questioning is a little bit confusing to me. Yeah. That was where the committee stands. No, just because when I was first answering this question, I immediately went to some of those kinds of uh, metrics and yeah. other members said, well, that's not really what we're looking for on this. So I'm, I'm getting yeah. I'm losing a sense of what the committee is asking for. The committee or the, the um, this committee? Or this committee, individual member. I, I, I don't know if there's consensus among this committee whether it's that type of data that you were just talking about and that I that yeah. started talking about, or whether it's okay. other kinds of things like surveys or, you know, whether it's a combination of both. Well, surveys are data. So if we see a difference in response rates and surveys, that's data. I, I'm not sure there's a difference there, but I, I might be confused myself. I guess what I'm trying to push for, Dr. Provost, is that maybe we can accept what we have tonight as a great 80, 90 percent step in the right direction. But in turn, given the implementation plan that you're developing that hopefully will be approved by the all team with some changes and some additional data that would demonstrate to us 
as a committee that all these changes have resulted in something that we could measure, that we can be proud of, and that we could see whether it's through um, test scores or survey results or attendance at meetings or number of meetings or however we want to measure it, I can certainly help you with that. I think maybe that would be a next step. I'm just trying to draw some conclusion here that we can be proud of the work that we've done, but maybe additional work to, would be um, even better to close the loop. So that's, I, I think again, thank you for your implementation plan and that would be another alternative as we take this to one more level to accommodate what we're bringing up tonight. So I, I was actually thinking of that when this, when I was first contemplating this motion, I wonder if it would be possible for the school committee to approve the plan and then, you know, ask for more detail on the implementation plan and metrics or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think I'd be in favor of that, but yeah, thank you. Member Levy. So that is exactly what I was going to suggest. And I was going to say very similar to what member Kaufman just said. Uh, and also I want to reiterate that this, the metrics we're looking for isn't for the 69 items, it's for the four goals. And I, I was not saying when you were suggesting specific metric, metrics, I wasn't saying the metrics themselves were off. I was saying those, the metrics you were suggesting were to measure the action items and what I'm saying is some of what member Kaufman suggested seem like really great metrics to measure the goals. It's to measure the goals, not the action items. That's simply where I was trying to go when you were, when you were giving those suggestions. So I, I kind of want to hear the motion that's on the floor again, because I, I want to offer a friendly amendment, but it might actually be just a different motion. So is it possible, member Gold, can you repeat your motion? Uh, here, I'll share um, my screen and then we could see it. And um, this is what I said. Uh, I could read it too, if you guys want. No, that's okay. Thank you. So I, I don't, I guess I would offer a bit of a different motion. So perhaps it's too much of a friendly amendment because I was going to suggest what, what Superintendent Provost just suggested, which is that we pass this we, we vote to approve this plan with your number one, with, um, with basically metrics and, and, and more detail about implementation. So, and, it, and I wanna be clear that when we look at your implementation plan, the metrics shouldn't be attached to each different item on your implementation plan. The metrics should be attached to the goals themselves and allow us to understand if, the items on your implementation plan are allowing you to then achieve the goal. And as member Kaufman already offered, I also would be really happy to help you work on that if it would be helpful. So I don't know what I'm saying. Is I'm that, saying yeah. I, I want to put forth another, another motion, but there's already a motion on the table. So that's where I stand. You can offer an amendment to the motion that's on the floor. Okay. And it may or may not be accepted. So I guess the motion that I'm, or the amendment that I'm offering is that um, we vote to approve the district improvement plan that's been presented to us with the, with the superintendent coming back to the school committee with a robust implementation plan that includes metrics associated with the goals. So is there a second on that amendment to Member Gold's amendment? I'll second I it. I will second it. Okay, we've got multiple seconds there. Is that a, okay. I think it was being offered as a friendly amendment. Yeah, I'm confused. Is that what you were going to try and answer Member Gold? Yeah, I thought it that was being was. offered. But I, I, think, I think it was offered as an amendment, but I, I was unclear whether I think. I I'm think happy to offer it as a friendly amendment and if it's, if you don't want it as a friendly mm -hmm. amendment, then I'll offer it as a non-friendly amendment. Um, so I can I explain why I would so you understand why I don't accept it as a friendly amendment? Because I think the I think it's important to understand the whole piece about the smarty goal alignment. And when we really see that and and as educators, as Sean, yeah, Sean's on here, like member condon's on here and you know any teachers on here know like we have to do those goals like that so 
I don't know. I, I can't accept it as a friendly amendment. If you're going to make it as an amendment, yeah, I guess you can do that. And then um, I could explain why I wouldn't support that amendment. Yeah, I guess I would make it then as an amendment. And I will say that I too am an educator and I work a lot with SMART goals. And I do think these goals are SMART. We're just missing the metrics. Uh, they are measurable, even though we don't know what the metrics are. Uh, I don't know what the IE are in your SMARTY, but so I'll offer it up as an amendment then. Okay, so there's been an amendment made and seconded, which is basically to amend Member Gold's amendment. Um, uh, so um, my motion, I didn't make it. Your amendment. motion, rather, yeah. Um, so um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. And okay. so can somebody you read it? <laughs> um, Member Levy, would you repeat your? Uh, your yeah, could you type it up maybe and so we can read it too so we can really know what my understanding was that it was to basically approve the dip um but with the understanding that dr provost would come back with both the implementation plan as well as the metrics for the four main um goals of the dip correct correct and wouldn't there be need to be discussion on that mayor or not there certainly could be discussion. I, okay. just, I wasn't hearing much, which is why I was calling the question. So. Oh, no, my guy, my hands are up. There's hands up. Okay. Member Cox um, and Sarah Cox. And mine. Okay, so member Sarah Cox. My hand was up about the original motion. Okay, so. sorry, I just put it back down. I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. It can be down, that's fine. Okay, member Gold. Yeah, so mine is in regards to um, the accepting the goals as they are. Um, and I just like to share this because th this is, uh, this is from department of education. Um, this is why, and then they're called smarty because they're now they've added inclusion, um, inclusive and equity and equitable to it. But this is from, are you guys seeing my screen here? Yeah, it's a little, a little low, but all right. Yeah. Let me make it not so low. One second here. I don't know what happened here. Du -du -du. All right, let's see if we got it higher here. All right. So this is from the 2021, this is the most recent educator evaluation. Um, and I, I bring this up because I think if this is what we're holding um, educators when they're creating student learning goals, when they're creating their own goals that administrators are creating, I think our district, we should hold ourselves to the same level of goal setting. And these are the SMARTY goals here. And, and here is an example of what is actually um, an, an example goal. Like a goal should have metrics within it, right? Like it says, here, here's just, this is a totally random one, but it says through relationship building with families, additional technology support, providing flexible and culturally relevant options for assigning completion, four out of five students in our ninth grade remote learning cohort from low income households will be present, right? Like th that is a goal that is measurable that is um, that we can that we can actually have a, a timeline for because we say okay we're going to go from we're at where are we at now we know if we're at two out of five we can go up to four out of five we can go from sixty percent up to ninety percent like we can actually have it stated within the goal and so that's why I can't accept it because the goal isn't the goal those four goals don't speak to this and don't speak to that alignment that we're expecting of ours teachers to make for students and administrators to make for teachers. And I think that, you know, we as a school community need to make for our district. I, I don't think that um, before seeing what those metrics are to make sure that they're reasonable that we can vote to approve. So I couldn't support that amendment. Anyone else who wishes to speak on Member Levy's amendment before I ask the clerk to call the roll? Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you just please clarify? We're, not, we're, we're why, why aren't we voting on Member Gold's amendment and we're voting on Member Levy's? Well, sorry. so Member Gold made a motion. Yeah. Um, and Member Levy is using a parliamentary 
making a, an amendment to that motion. So she's basically amend, seeing if we can amend his motion. Okay, yes. Hold on, but is that, I'm not sorry, Mayor, but is that an amending my motion? I mean, essentially it's, it's a different motion. How's it different? How's it, explain to me the difference between an amendment and a different motion. Well, I mean, you can have multiple layers of amendments going. Um, but, it, but it doesn't include anything that I'm, you know, like wouldn't it have to be like, changing the text that i put up there that's amending it right like she's i she, said i'm uh, voting she's to basically post. replacing and you know yeah that doesn't sound like amending that sounds like that's well, not amending an amendment, uh, but that's robert's rules but it doesn't it's it sounds like under robert's rules to change the motion correct yep so what happens to member gold's motion in this case if, if this one passes what happens to then it becomes gold's? the new motion on the floor and we vote again uh, we vote on again. that actual uh, as amended, mm -hmm. basically amending his motion. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often because we're generally a friendly bunch and we amend <laughs> our allow people to amend our motions. But it, you know, yeah. but it's certainly within within you know parliamentary procedure. Okay. No, thank you for clarifying. So I, I'll, I'll vote yes again. Thank you, Member Goldman. Yes, Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. No. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Fallon. No. Member Sophie Cox. Yes. And Member Condon. No. Uh, the, the vote is six yeses and three noes. Okay, so now we um, come back to, uh, so, so basically there's now an amended uh, motion on the floor. Um, and I would ask if there's any further discussion on that. Um, if not, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. No, oh, sorry, member I Box. Have, member Box. I just want to clarify if member Levy could just read it again. I want to just make sure I don't want to offer a friendly anything to it. It might be fine. Sorry. I can reword it. I'm not sure I can get it exactly the same. I don't know if Annie, you it's can okay. read it I, as it is. Uh, I have an amendment to a vote to approve the dip as presented. Wait, uh, no. I actually maybe don't have everything I need to no, have on no. this. So maybe you should reword this because no, I can do this like twice. Approve the dip as presented uh, with this, with the superintendent returning to the school committee with a robust implementation plan and specific metrics attached to each of the four goals. That is what I have. Thank you. That's great. I'm very happy with that. Thanks. Okay, so a member gold. Um, member Levy, can I ask, how do you feel like we can approve this plan if our first goal is to empower educators, sorry, empower caregivers to give input to us on these four goals and they did not have a chance to? Caregivers didn't have a chance to. Let's be straight about it. Like school commit, school councils did not get this until maybe at earliest last week. So they did not have a chance to have a public meeting like member Fallon, I think it was, or someone was mentioning. Like our goal literally is to engage and empower caregivers. And we're passing this without doing that. Like I really struggle with that piece of it. I really, really, really struggle with that piece. And those other two points of it that there's no, you know, we know from our very first meeting that student achievement, school achievement performance is that was our prior, prior, uh, primary obligation as a school committee. And that's not within any of those four goals. It's not labeled, it's, it only appears in the glossary. So I think that um, I would love to know the answers to that before um, hearing how we're gonna vote on this. Sure, well, I think that student achievement is embedded within, and that's something that can very much show up as a metric associated with these goals. It, all of these goals are related to, to student achievement. And so by using student achievement as the metric, that will allow us to understand and see clearly the relationship. So that's where I'm excited to, to see that come back with the metrics. Um, 
I think to your point about having it be in this exact same format that you are asked to as a teacher, I want to I want to make clear that goals can be smart goals, be measurable, and have those metrics and have the timelines be associated with the goals and come back with those. If they're still smart goals, even if the language isn't within the specific goals, it can be it can be associated and attached to it. Um, I think, I mean, to a certain extent, like, would we love to have more input? Would I love to? Absolutely. But I'm hearing from folks that there are issues with the timeline and that, and that if we're waiting until July to pass this, that that puts the school, um, the school councils in an impossible place to be able to do the work that they need to do. I hear you that there were things that you wanted that didn't show up in the document. And I also know that this was a group process that we spent months and months and months and months on, and we all had opportunities to voice what we wanted to see in the document. Um, this is a public meeting. Caregivers are able to, to attend, to give input. And again, like in a perfect world, I actually, I mean, your initial, your initial um, motion resonated with me. And in a perfect world, I would say yes to it. And I think we've got to also keep in mind the timelines that are associated with the work that needs to happen. So I am trying to both find a solution to the fact that we need metrics, we need timetables, we need to see those implementation plans. And we also have to have to give our school councils and our administrative leadership team the time to really work with this document and use it to move to move the work forward. And I guess if I could respond to that, this last piece about giving school councils time, I mean, in serving on the Bridge Street School Council, it was very challenging to create a school improvement plan because the previous district improvement plan did not have metrics defined within the goals. Like we had to come up with our own rubric on how are we going to assess it? You know what I mean? Like, I think it's, if anything, giving it more time will help the school councils because it'll help guide their work and say, okay, how are we as a school going to achieve these metrics, right? Like if there's no, if they don't have those metrics in place there. Well, we're asking for those metrics. Those metrics are coming. We're simply saying, please bring us those metrics next time around. But yes, move forward with these goals because we think these goals are good. Um, without knowing the... I guess I would say like we're approving it without knowing what the metrics are. And if the metrics, you know, are too lofty, then what happens? If the metrics are too low, then what like if we're, you know, you approve four out of five, or you know, you you approve a metric, you approve a goal based on the if the reasonableness of the metric. And the other thing being, I just don't see how we're gonna cut caregivers out of this. I really don't. We've, we're cutting caregivers, our very first goal, we're cutting them out of the process. And I find it very shocking that that might pass tonight. You will have the opportunity to vote on those metrics when they come to us. We're not saying yes to all the metrics, whatever they are. We're saying we wanna see them and they could change depending on, on our feedback. But the metrics aren't gonna shift the content of the goals. No, the goals, and the, we're not getting feedback from caregivers about the four goals. That's the whole point. A few more hands. Um, uh, Megan, do it from the, uh, from the dip team. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I wanted to reassure Member Gold a little bit that um, I know you were part of the team. As the months went on, um, the the membership somehow dwindled of who actually came to the working the meetings and there were a lot of inter working meetings. The, ma the majority of the caregivers, uh, there were a lot of caregivers on the, the DIP team and those tended to be the ones that hung in there. A lot of them um, were actively involved in some of the later working meetings when we were really involved in the nitty gritty. Um, so I just wanna reassure you, there was quite a bit of very active um, caregiver input into this dip. Um, I know for the JFK, um, since some of us that were on the, the dip uh, meet committee also were working, were on, on school councils, we also tended to share with our school councils so they could see in our, in our, for the April meeting. Um, to, this is where, what we're doing. This is 
at least I can only speak for the JFK, but members were aware of the work going on, where we were headed and able to give um, general feedback about the thought process. So I did want to reassure it's not that caregivers were cut out of this, uh, this process. Okay, Member Condon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I have a, a few thoughts. I haven't said much so far. Uh, I, I very much like the direction that these four goals are heading, uh, much like most of the members, I think, agree. Um, I, I do like Member Gold, uh, feel that in some way the metrics should be entwined with the goals themselves uh, as, as educators are expected to do. But I, I also understand uh, Dr. Provost and, and others, uh, you know, working on those metrics separately. Uh, and like Member Levy said, voting on those separately, I'm okay with that. Uh, my sticking point is I'm, I'm not fully convinced that the public has had as much a possibility to really look over the full four goals and, and give input. I've, I've heard from a few community members who ha had a small window to look at it. Um, and as I think a few other people have pointed out, I mean, one of the goals really is all about that. It's about really in incorporating feedback from the public into it. So for me, I guess, that's that's my sticking point. That's why I, I voted no uh, to Member Levy's amendment, uh, and why I think I'm going to stay with no as well. Um, I, I guess uh, you know we talk, I, I've heard the July time frame thrown out. Um, I believe we have a meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, would I, I, is it possible to revisit this at that meeting? Uh, and at least you know two more weeks to garner some feedback from the public. Uh, I guess I, I don't I don't know, I don't know who I'm posing that question to, but I'll throw that out there as my final comment. Okay, um, uh, Doctor, I don't know if that was directed to Doctor Provost. I mean, I'm assuming that that would entail getting the. Um, school councils to have meetings within the next two weeks. I don't know how that's even feasible, Dr. Provost. Well, if it's the pleasure of the committee, I think my, my sense is that sending it to the school councils will result in the same kind of result we have now where people wonder, well, what about other parents who are not part of the school council? So what I could do, I could foresee doing in the next two weeks is mailing this to every single parent in the district and asking them to forward their comments to the school committee. That certainly could be done in two weeks. That could be done tomorrow. Uh, Member Gold, your hand is up next. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, I, I want to take some responsibility for, um, some of the misunderstanding that's come about here that the school committee did not direct or guide the DIP team to provide goals that specifically had metrics embedded in them or, um, ask for I mean, I think you could guess that we're, we're very, our, this school committee is very interested in the details and the, the reasons why a decision was made one way instead of the other and what were the other options that you considered when you decided on this one. And so I think that there have been a number of cases with other um, topics that the school committee is looking for teams to come and report about where we've been unsatisfied um, with how the goals were laid out. You know, this was a big conversation about the superintendent evaluation goals uh, last year in the process. And so um, we're still following that process, but I, I'm sure that the next time we go through the superintendent evaluation that 
will need, you know, we're looking for the more measurable pieces. And um, I just, I think this is a theme that has come up before that we're looking for more clarity and transparency about processes and um, also to uphold our reputation. It's important to be able to clearly define what our goal was and that we achieved it. And so that is success instead of there being um, debate about whether or not we reached a goal or this sort of a thing. So um, you're, it's true that the first goal is about engagement and that's a goal, it's an aspiration and it's um, a topic we've talked about a lot. And so I think it's a really important goal and something we should move towards going forward. It's a huge community. And the other thing is that a lot of these things are happening where we're right now having this big conversation, but then it kind of dwindles and then it shows up and it's another big conversation. And I think maybe getting ahead of these things a little bit where the expectations are clear. So that we're not setting anyone up for disappointment because right now everyone is a little disappointed. Um, a way that we can say ahead of time, like, you know, it is important to the school committee again and again and again, that parents are involved, that teachers are involved, that the alt team is involved. Um, we're wondering what other school committees are doing. We're a very engaged committee and I so appreciate that. And I really appreciate the diverse voices that are coming to the table. Um, and so if we're able to say, you know, the dip will be presented in June and it will be reviewed and or it will be presented in April and then in May this will happen and then June will take the vote where there's a timeline where certain populations um, contributions will be collected and integrated into the project. We're going to have to do dip project dips um, with or without me for you know as long as the district is doing them and so I think it makes sense to have a clear sense of what we're looking for and to recognize that the um, district improvement plan we have before us is 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 progress it's it's exactly what we need right now and it meets our needs for so many people and it's going to be really valuable to implement um, in our district um, and that's sort of what I have to say for that. So I am in favor of um, approving this district improvement plan. I am very interested in seeing uh, implementation plan and goals and you know smarty goals or goals with metrics so that we can have some clarity and transparency. We can all be on the same page about what we as a committee also are moving um, towards in these next three years where we can come together knowing that we have goals in common as well. Thank you. Member Boss. Thanks. Um, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I'm really impressed by how inclusive the team was that worked on this. And what I've gotten out of tonight's conversation is just how busy everyone is. And at sometimes not everybody could come, but I do feel like there was a real effort to reach out to a broad group of our community. And I wanna thank you for that. I, I'm usually the one that says we need more of that. And I, I do think we need more of that, but really along the lines of member Goldman, what she just said, um, we have to keep striving for more of that, but I'm not sure that now is the time to hold something up that has a timeline. And um, we're all elected members of this committee. And what I can say, what I said earlier about these goals is they're beautiful. And I think they fit with what my constituents shared with me when I've talked to them. And um, they reflect a district that I would be proud of. So I always wanna hear more perspective and ideas and these kind of conversations should go on, but I'm worried it's gonna slow down important work that needs to get done. And with the amended motion, I feel like my bigger concern after listening to everybody who was involved in this was, how are we gonna make sure we do them? And there's been a solution to that. So at this point, I'm pretty comfortable moving forward with this. Um, it isn't to say people shouldn't give input, but it's to say we're gonna always be continually improving and we need to make progress. 
And with that, I'd actually like to call the question and vote on the um, motion on the floor. You're muted, Mayor. And one more hand left. So if you'd like to call the question, that I, would require I, a second and a vote. So, um, or if you ask. give me a chance to call the question after the remaining hand, that's fine. Okay. Or we could just vote. Member Gold. All right. Um, the last thing I'll share in regarding to what Megan was sharing, because there definitely was a broad range of parents and it was great. Um, at the same time, I don't know how representative it was of our community. And I also don't know if enough of a broad range of voices were heard there. Um, the other thing being, if we approve this plan, I just would like to know how is how do we all the school committee know what our teachers actually think about this plan? Because I don't recall us hearing anything from uh, school councils and, and what the teachers were thinking. So we might be approving a plan without actually knowing what if teachers think not only about the goals, but what the measurements are, even if they're attainable or not. Like, I don't feel like we were able to say, you know, a teacher might get a goal and say, wait a minute, that's not realistic, or that's too low for my students, or that's not high enough for my students. So being able to hear from teachers before we approve a plan, I think also beyond the just caregivers would be incredibly important. You're muted, Mayor. Right, Mr. Samuelson, I'm sorry, I recognize you, Andrew. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks for allowing me to jump in here and having um, being part of the conversation. And, and thank you, Member Gold, um, for lifting the voices of teachers. Um, please know that uh, when we met as a uh, as a team, um, we were reaching out to our colleagues for input on on these goals, um, especially to the department chairs and team leaders. So. For the please know that for the activities um, and, and all of those that support the goals, certainly teachers were a part of that conversation. Thank you. Okay, so um, I see no other hands. So the motion then is on the table, and I will call the ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. I didn't hear you, Member Gold, I'm sorry. Uh, no. Um, Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Fallon. Uh, no. Member Serfie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Yes. The vote is six yes, five no. I mean, three now. Sorry. Okay, I, just thought we, I thought our rank swelled there for a minute. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. No like. problem. Okay, well, thank, so that motion carries. And um, Dr. Provost, you have now have a fairly good sense of the committee and what, um, what folks would be looking for uh, to come back to us with. And um, again, thank you to everyone for all the work in, um, in putting together the plan and presenting it this evening. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for your support. So now we move to um, two items that were put on the agenda uh, by Member Goldman. Um, and they, those are the self-evaluation for school committee and the school committee norms. So I'll turn it over to Member Goldman, who wants to raise these issues with us. Um, thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Um, there was a miscommunication for these items and I had hoped to provide um, material for your review before bringing them to the table. And so, um, so that you know, here it is. I am interested in initiating a um, super, uh, school committee self-evaluation process. Uh, I think we just 
spent a long time talking about the value of having clearly defined measurable goals um, that we can all rally around, um, both for us as a committee and also for our community um, to hold ourselves, to hold us accountable. Um, and then the norms are not yet complete. And so I'm hoping we can, uh, I'll send those, distribute those, we can finish them and then vote on them. Um, and so I'm making a motion to delay both of these items to the June 10th school committee meeting. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Any discussion? Oh, Member Levy. I just a question. This is something I've been wondering since I learned about school committee evalu self-evaluations. I wonder how we evaluate ourselves if we haven't set goals. And I, I, I understand that like the district improvement plan is a little bit the goals of the school committee, but we're sort of in between district improvement plans. So I, I, maybe that's gonna be a part of the conversation next time around. And if it is, I will just sit on the edge of my seat and wait to understand that. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that if, if it's appropriate to talk about that now. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have the materials that describe, um, that you know I'll distribute before the meeting that describe what is entailed. And it is, uh, I would propose it doesn't start until the next school committee um, comes in uh, in January, that we, we wouldn't start an evaluation process until then and it, um, and I hope that June 10th would be very much a time of discussion um, and maybe a time where people have more questions and then we would delay a vote on whether to do it or not. There, I don't think we necessarily need to vote on it in June. We just, I'd like to have a discussion about it. Got it, thanks. Okay, so there's a motion uh, to delay these two items to our June meeting. If there's no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquitz. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. And Member Kaufman. Yes. The vote is unanimous. Okay, so the vote carries and these two items will be pushed to our June meeting. Uh, thank you, Member Goldman, for, uh, for your willingness to keep us on task in completing these two items. Um, so the um, next item is on the agenda. We do have uh, I don't believe we have any old business. Um, uh, we have no school committee discussion topics this evening. Future business and meeting dates. We have school committee on May 27th and June 10th at 6.45. Um, and then the second uh, 2021 school committee retreat on Thursday, June 17th at 6.30 p.m. Um, before we adjourn, Member Fallon, I know you wanted to do so a clarification of the record, I believe. Yeah, so I just, can I just say to the school committee, that whole conversation we had earlier felt like um, Groundhog Day or deja vu. Um, and I realized it was because we've had it before. Um, and I found the document, I will share it with the, the um, subcommittee on superintendent evaluation, but I had reported back to the committee after, in, 2019 after doing that drive-in on superintendent evaluations. And there was a document that they had given me that I shared with you all. And we had a lot of discussion about that referenced that Lincoln Sudbury case and how we do exactly what member boss was saying as far as compiling the documents. And the part that I forgot was that in between that Lincoln Sudbury case and these new um, superintendent evaluations, there was a Supreme Judicial Court decision that overturned the attorney general's um, advice. So the, all the information about that is in the document. I don't know if I should send it to um, 
to the subcommittee chair or to the whole committee um, since it's for informational purposes, but it does talk about how the most important thing is that the release of that composite evaluation of the superintendent has to be, um, it's considered a deliberation. And so we have to make that available to the public at the same time that it's made available to the members unless the members see it for the first time in the public meeting. Do you know what I'm saying? I think it's best for you to share that with- the, Yeah, I'm sorry. The, but anyway, so yeah, the yeah. Supreme Court ruling, everything's in the document. It's 35 pages long from, um, from the MASC on the whole process. Okay, uh, that would be helpful for you to send that, maybe even include the superintendent as well, since he'll need to try to navigate that. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification, uh, Member Fallon, appreciate it. Um, and now I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. Vote is unanimous. Okay, so the motion carries and the Thursday, May 13th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>